Hey y'all, this is Jared Johnson and you're listening to the Garrett Smith Podcast. All right, everybody. I sort of owe you an apology. Yesterday I said there'd be no April Fool's jokes and there weren't, but I accidentally fibbed. Um, Three different times with Gabe Fidel, I said that the third episode would be ambulance chasers who are here to sue Gabe and myself for everything we said on the last podcast. And uh, (laughs) thankfully, along with that, we did not get sued by Garth Brooks and AJ Gale has not sued me. So there was a lot of suing being alleged in that last podcast. None of it happened. Um, But instead of instead of a lawyer, I'm bringing you something much better. Uh, First of all. If anyone name drops Stephen James from now on, this is the sound bite you're going to get. Oh, yeah. And today's guest is none other than Mr. Jared Johnson. Jared, what's going on, man? Oh, nothing, man. I'm just uh, hanging out in Round Rock, Texas at the house, uh, avoiding contact and everything else that uh, that we're supposed to be doing. Uh, just trying not to... Uh, you know, drive my wife so nuts that she wants to kick me out. <laughs> this is a weird time in history because all of us are actually doing what the government tells us to do. That it is strange. It is really strange. And and I actually I kind of jumped on the bandwagon early. Um, my daughter, uh, my my middle child, she's uh, going to be a senior at Texas A and M. Um, yeah, gig him. Uh, she had, uh, I've recently just kind of got her back into my life. I mean, we'll, we'll get into my story later with, you know, alcoholism and rehab and all that stuff, but I've, I've repaired that relationship and, um, I had some bus work to do in Dallas. I had a bus remodel to do and, and I was really hemming and hawing because I was going to be by myself and, uh, all this stuff and, and we really need the money. And my daughter just told me, you know, I really don't want you to go. And, and she brought up the fact that, yes, okay, I've got, you know, I've, I'm starting to just get a loose grip on this sobriety thing. Uh, I still haven't kicked cigarettes yet. And, you know, I've been smoking cigarettes for a long time now. And she said, dad, if you get this, you probably won't survive. And that kind of, you know, that kind of hit home. So, so I kind of jumped on the, the stay home wagon a little bit early. Um, not so much out of, out of fear for my own life. Of course that's there, but fear out of out of you know what what that would do to other people and and me possibly bringing it to other people yeah um you know it kind of her saying that really put a whole new uh, perspective on it for me because you know for years i lived as if i was never gonna die yeah and and um and now yeah i'm 44 i kind of got to change the way i see things i got to start looking after my health and yes cigarettes have got to go you know that's the next thing on the list uh but while I'm still getting a hang of, uh, like I said, while I'm still getting a hang of sobriety, I, I kind of lean on them a little bit to, uh, uh, you know, to, sometimes I get the urge and, and I want to, yeah, I want to run to the liquor store and, uh, you know, a, a phone call and, and chain smoking sometimes helps me, uh, <laughs> you know, helps me not do that. So, um, I'm not proud of that, but right now it's what's, you know, it's, it's keeping me sober. So that's, uh, that's my reality right now. So. Well, it's, I mean, and it's great that you're able to stay strong with that. And I, I know we're very early in the podcast, but there are a lot of people, musicians and non-musicians alike, who are not doing as well with that during the during the quarantine and during all the social distancing. And the fact that liquor stores have been deemed an essential business, they're still there. You know, they're still accessible and it's got to be easy for someone to relapse. I mean, what what would you tell somebody that may not have a sponsor or may not have someone to lean on? You know, what, what would your advice be to somebody that during this time is going to be kind of feel that presence, that shadow over them. Well, first of all, um, for me anyway, uh, I've got to believe in something greater than myself. And you know, that, that can be any kind of higher power. I I choose to call it God. Um, but it can be a group of people or it can be, um, you know, some people, some people, they have no conception of a higher power. They've been raised that way or, you know, they might've been raised in a really strict religious household. And so the idea of God just turns them off. Um, but you just got to have that little bit of faith that there's something out there greater than yourself. And like I said, it could be a group of people. It could be a group of friends. Okay. When I, when I am with this group of friends, that is a power greater than myself because I can talk to them and I can, you know, I can get through this, you know, they, they can help me get through this urge and all that. So, so having a power greater than yourself can be many things. Um, but you have to have something like that to really, you know, help you get through because we, we, you know, you can't do it on your own. You cannot, you know, some people, 
there, there are people out there that, uh, you know, they can just decide to quit drinking or quit smoking and bam, they do it. Um, if you're a true addict, uh, you don't have that power all on your own. Right. Um, so you need to, you need to have other people. You need to have, uh, you know, a power out there that's greater than yourself to help you get through it. So all that being said, um, you know, praying, and if you don't, you know, that, that step one is praying. And if you don't believe in something, if they're, you know, just, you know, what the heck, give it a shot, you know, give it a shot. Just, you know, you don't even have to get on your knees. Just say, Hey, if there's anything out there, you know, just, just help me, you know, help me get through this, you know, help, help take away that this powerlessness that I feel over my addiction, you know, whatever, you know, it, yeah. it can just be whatever it is. And you just start there. And of course, you got to have other people to talk to. You've got to be able to make a phone call. Um, it's not always easy to call your parents or to call siblings or, or it's not even, sometimes it's not even, you can't even talk to your significant other. Um, you really need some, if you're like me, you need somebody uh, that has the same problem you do. Um, you know, there's no other uh, person that me as an alcoholic can relate to better than another alcoholic. Right. I think that's um, so key to people to because I feel like there's a self conscious level that people are going to go through and say, you know, well, I don't want I want people to think I've let everyone down or people to, I don't know, you, you name the label. It's people got to realize that yeah. they're not alone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and and there still is. I mean, not so much as there was like you know back in the 1930s when when Bill Wilson was was you know authoring these 12 steps and everything. There was a really just a real negative stigma around alcoholism. Um, and it's still there. It's still there. I mean, I even see it every once in a while, I'll make a post on social media and usually it's humorous about, about my past with alcoholism. Um, but if some people will say, well, you have no willpower, you know, you, 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 so there still is that, that stigma there that, that alcoholics are just, um, bad people or, uh, you know, addicts, um, you know, they made bad choices, um, you know, it's not a disease, it's choices. It's not a disease, it's choices. When the American Medi Medical Association has it defined as a disease. Right. Um, so it is, and for me, it is a disease, And but I can't control what other people think. Mm -hmm. um, and if I try to change somebody else's mind on that, I'm going to make myself miserable. So I, I generally stay out of those arguments. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, there's, so there still is that, that negative stigma attached to it that makes people not want to come out, you know, publicly like, like, you know, myself, you know, I have no problem admitting it. Ray Wiley Hubbard has no, you know, he has no problem admitting it in his book and everything else. I mean, so there's people out there that have no problem with it, but when you're first going through it, um, it's, it's tough to come right out and say it, that you have a problem. You know, you don't want, you don't want people looking down on you. You don't, you don't want to feel embarrassed. You, you know, none of us want to feel that way. So it's, it's tough. It's yeah. tough. And, and the, the newcomers, you know, the, the, the people that are trying to get better, uh, that are new to trying to get better. I, I have so much respect for those people because that is the hardest part of it all. Um, that, that, that is absolutely the hardest part of, of trying to recover. So yeah, th those people, those are the strongest people, um, you know, in, in the world to me, you know, they're right up there with the people that are battling cancer that are, you know, I I any type of life and death situation. Um, you know, people trying to recover from addiction are right up there with all those people. Yeah. Well, you know where the best place to change somebody's mind is? Nowhere. A Facebook argument. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Especially have, when it comes to politics. <laughs> I, I know. I, you know, I have changed my mind so many times based on, you know, <laughs> I, I, I have changed my votes. I, I have, I, I have flip-flop political parties like a catfish out of water, man. I have, I've become a I doctor, have, a scientist, I, a politician. <laughs> <laughs> I know it all. Man, and it's, uh, I think all of us as human beings, I mean, that is, it, it is so hard for us not to want to state our opinion. Yeah. Uh, you know, and because we all have them. We all have them. You know, we all vote the way we vote. We all believe the way we believe. Um, you know, we all have our, our own little belief systems. And, and to us, it's the correct way of doing things. Yeah. And, and, you know, trying to get other people to see that is not always, you know, the best, especially on social media. Social media has really, I had a, a buddy back in Nashville, his name was Josh McNamara, and years, I mean, right right when, you know, Facebook had just gone, you know, you know to phones, you know, it just wasn't on the computer anymore. Um, he was saying, we are becoming, the you know, the most 
uns, unsociably social people, you know, in the world, you know, in anybody that has these phones. And it's so true when you're not face to face with somebody, you don't, you're not forced to actually engage a person. Yeah. When you're, when you're engaging on social media, you're engaging strictly just words. You know, yeah. that's all you're engaging. It's like having an argument with a book, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And it's so weird um, to me. Like I was talking to Gabe Fidel about this last night. People will say anything when they're feeling big and bad behind a keyboard because, you know, 12 years ago, 15 years, however long ago, throughout most of my life, it didn't matter how much you didn't like a politician, like the president of the United States. If they walked in the room, you were still going to stand up and be like, whoa, it's the president. You know, now every high, high school kid in the country is like, you suck, Trump. You know, it's like, dude, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he's probably not reading your tweets. Well, the current president might be. I don't know. But right, right. It's just a weird thing what people say when they're not in front of your face. It is. It, 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 it's a. Uh... And uh, social media has done a lot of great things. I'm not. I'm not going to badmouth social media. I am on it all the time, obviously. Oh yeah. Um, and I, I, call, would be stu- I call Twitter a useful cesspool. <laughs> it really is. No, it really. And I, w- I would be stupid to ignore um, the benefits of of social media, especially for songwriters and musicians. Oh yeah. Yeah, and yeah, you know, some people say, well, it's really watered down everything, and there's so much music out there that you can't be, you can't get noticed, you can't do, you know, whatever. Well, you know, if that's the case, um, it, it can be a great motivator. Okay, I need to write better songs. You know, I need I need to put out better albums if I'm going to gain if I want to get more followers and all this stuff. Or, you know, you can just be grateful for the two thousand followers that you have because, you know, twenty years ago, uh, you know, your mom and dad and your sister might be getting a CD. Yeah, you know what I mean. And now, um, you know, now people can you know as much as I hate streaming media. Um, you know, now people can hear your music that never would have heard your music before. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm very grateful for that. I, you know, 20 years ago. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I had a publishing deal and I was writing with some really cool people, but the amount of people that could hear the music I was writing, uh, you know, it wasn't there to, you know, today it's, you know, worldwide, you know, anybody can hear my music if they want to, you know, if they want to hear it. So, um, so yeah, it, it's done a lot of, a lot of really good things, but as far as, uh, communication skills um yeah i'm pretty sure mine have have you know dumbed down <laughs> a few days since social media came out just because I'll, you know, I'll do that i'll engage in social media and, and uh i would say this to the parents who are having to homeschool right now during quarantine teach mm-hmm. some freaking grammar because if you get on youtube or twitter anywhere it our english it's has awful. declined oh man it's so awful and, and my daughter you know god bless her she's doing so well in, in, in school um, but yeah, her texts are just horrid. <laughs> they are just horrid. <laughs> and, uh, when I was in school, I mean, you know, punctuation and, you know, where to put quotation marks. And, you know, when you're writing like, like the title to a song, you know, when I, when I'm, when I was just writing out my liner notes and, and when I'm sending, you know, my music via email out to radio stations and stuff, I, I, I want the title to be properly you know, capital letters and, and, you know, that the non-important words, you know, they don't get the capital letters and I want everything to, to look right. Me too. And, <laughs> and, and that's probably not, not, I, I guess today it's not a big deal, but, but to me, that's just how I, you know, so many things get lost, um, you know, over, of course, over the years, you know, things get lost in translation, blah, 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 blah. I would hate to see just proper grammar and even cursive writing. I still write in cursive and especially for writers. I mean, there's just something elegant about writing something in cursive, you know, writing a manuscript in cursive, writing a song. What I'm these lyric sheets I'm doing as uh, Kickstarter rewards, you know, for the people that pledged to my record, I'm writing them in cursive. I just think it's, I don't know. It's really cool. Yeah. And I'm probably Dalton Domino did something like that. If I'm not mistaken, I think he did some sort of handwritten lyric thing. And if I I don't remember if he did in cursive or not, but I remember thinking it was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. He probably did. And Dalton's Dalton's a pretty serious writer and, and um, yeah, he, he might've, I don't know. I just take that stuff. uh, I shouldn't say serious, but it just means to me, it just means something, you know, it, it just, I don't know. Really cool gesture. Yeah. Speaking of Twitter, I don't know if you know this and Gosh, I'm gonna have to play my new soundbite for saying this, but uh, this this pertains to you and Stephen James. Oh, yeah. The reason I met either of you initially was Twitter, and uh, what happened was in 2016 when I was living in Houston, I was still getting started. I had 
you know, no bass. I hadn't recorded or I had just barely recorded and was still trying to reach for scraps. I, I couldn't afford publicity or anything like that. I was like, I've got a network somehow and I don't know how. And eventually, because I was working as a recruiter for Texas Tech University at the time, I'd be sitting in a high school cafeteria just waiting on kids to come by my table and give the same spiel over and over again. I was like, I need yeah. some variety. I got to figure out how to get this music being kicked off and it's just not working. So I created this Twitter account and I called it something like Red Dirt Fanatics or something. I don't remember. It was something like to promote music. And every day yeah. I would just start throwing other artists music out there. And yeah. what that did was it would give me recommendations on who to follow. I just anyone in their dog that showed up in there, I'd follow. And mm -hmm. you and Steven, a couple other people just kept popping up every day in my news feed. So eventually I, I, sh that. I shared y'all's yeah. stuff with one of my links one day and we all started following each other. And so eventually I got rid of that account because it kind of kicked off my algorithm. And I was like, well, I don't want to keep piggybacking off this. Plus I don't have time to maintain it. Yeah. And eventually uh, Steven was going to come play a show in Houston. Oh, yeah. And I was like, man, I need to make it to that show. And he tweeted me back. He's like, yeah, man, I need to come to one of yours. And I'm sitting there like, crap, I don't have shows yet. <laughs> you know, this is still like yeah. early, early. And uh, I went to his show, met him there. He and Rich were there. We hung out for a while. And Steven's like, well, dude, if you're not getting shows, come open for me. And uh, I think you and him were supposed to play a show together in Elgin. And he had to back out. And he was like, hey, you want yep. my spot? And so that is where you and I got to go play that show together. So that was the first time we got yeah. to really song swap and all that. So thank you, fake Twitter accounts. Y'all are the best. <laughs> I actually met my wife because of Twitter. Oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah, somebody, I was still living in Nashville. I, I had just started, um, it was when Empty Pillow started getting played on Texas radio by mistake. Um, it was weird how that happened. But yeah, uh, somebody hacked my Twitter account <laughs> and, and they just started following random people like crazy. But they were sending out all kinds of crazy stuff. You know, you know don't download this song, it sucks. Wow. And, but they were they were also sending out like porn pictures to people, and it was and somebody texted me and and uh, hey I think you need to change your Twitter password I think your account got hacked so I did that and uh, I changed my password and I sent out you know a blanket apology and I'm sorry about all this and um you know th th those pictures weren't me you know and, and I said well I kind of you know I wish it was me because <laughs> you, you know how those guys look. Um, and, uh, you know, I just said that and, you know, good night y'all. And, and, uh, and then Elizabeth, uh, tweeted back. She said, good night. If this is the real Jared Johnson. And that's just how we started communicating. And, uh, awesome. yeah. So, yeah. So somebody hacked my Twitter account and that's how I met Elizabeth who eventually, you know, became my wife. So that was kind of, kind of funny. I, I owe Twitter that, but I always have to be careful when telling that story. I have to, you know, it's Twitter, not Tinder. We yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah twitter twitter wasn't very nice to me this year and 2020 has been a weird year all around but for me my yeah. i kind of had something like that happen and i know anyone that's following me on twitter heard about this i was using a marketing service that i thought was just kind of building my algorithm and yeah. i know they did like an auto follow bot type thing but it yeah. was one of those deals where technically it was legal with twitter's guidelines so i trusted it whatever and yep. my following went up it had me following a bunch of people i didn't care to follow and it yeah. was kind of weird, but yeah. I was like, man, I just jumped from, you know, 600 people to a thousand or whatever in a week. I was like, this is cool. Little did I know that it was also going and liking random tweets on some weird algorithm. Yep. And I didn't see that. But everyone yep. else in the world that follows me could see Garrett Smith like this, Garrett Smith like that. Right. And unlike your friends, mine weren't texting me to tell me about the weird stuff I was apparently liking. And I was oblivious <laughs> for about two months. Finally, my buddy Tyler texted me. He's like, dude, this is the type of he, he had mentioned it. And I didn't know what he's talking about. And he sends yeah. me a screenshot of some stuff. He's like, this is what I'm talking about. And it was like some girl tweeted out something like I want my boobs lick. And it was like Garrett Smith liked this. And it was like some high school girl <laughs> saying that. I was like, oh, my gosh, I, I had an anxiety attack. I I mean, my brain just shut down at work. I had to log in, discontinue all these services. And I was freaked out. So. I was I was texting Hannah like, can you believe this happened? You know, and then because my wife's not on Twitter, so she didn't know about it. And I'm like, you've got Thank to see God. what just happened. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's, she's a big supporter and she knows how I operate. So she was as freaked out as I was. But we were yeah. for the same reason. And yeah. a lot of my former students who I'm still in contact with and try to, you know, 
give life advice to and things like that. I'm like, they saw this, you know? <laughs> so mm -hmm. I had to explain, I'm like, nope, that wasn't me. And, you know, if someone doesn't believe, oh, he's just saying it wasn't him, then whatever, you know, believe what you want. But I was like, the people that actually know me know that this wasn't me. Yeah. Pl plus the fact that it hasn't happened since I said, hey, I've shut this down. There's your proof. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, no I, I, I don't think I ever saw. Uh, and I know what you're talking about. Yeah. You'll see like, like if a tweet comes across and, and that'll make you think twice before liking something. Yeah. Um, you know, that is some, you know, sometimes it'll be like some off color joke. That's kind of wrong. <laughs> that. I'll, I'll want to like it, but I'm like, Whoa, yeah. probably not. <laughs> so, um, but I never saw anything like that come across my feed from you. Well, that's comforting. Um, but if I would have seen it, um, yeah, I, I know you pretty well. I probably, <laughs> I probably would have sent you a message and I probably would have thought you'd been hacked because yeah. the same thing happened to me. And, uh, it happened on my Instagram page too. Once that, um, it, it was while I was in treatment too. Oh you know, no. We, yeah. We don't have access to our phones, nothing. And I just, and they let me check my Instagram account. Oh, it was, it was for gigs. Um, and so I was checking on my social media accounts and I checked my Instagram account and all of a sudden, you know, I'd been following, you know, a couple thousand people. All of a sudden I was following like 8,000 people. Oh, and, wow. and I'm like, whoa. So I changed my password real quick. And, <laughs> and once I got out of, of treatment, it, it took me like three weeks to unfollow oh. all those, all those, and they were crazy accounts. So I mean, tedious. They were, and, and I'm still unfollowing accounts. I mean, and it's, um, it's, it's just a lot of shady accounts, yeah. uh, you know, and but so I'm still, I'm still working on that, but who, uh, yeah. who are some of your favorite ones to follow? My favorite accounts to follow. Like, cause um, I, I know that you know this person and I've not met this person, but uh, Rita from Coke FM is one of the funniest people. Oh, uh, like, she's so funny. Even if I don't she, agree with something she's saying, she makes it so funny that I'm like, that's awesome. Yeah. No, so <laughs> she, she has a very, she is gifted in that way where she can, she can state her opinion, state it very strongly but be hysterical about it <laughs> and not offend people. Right. Well, some people do get butt hurt, but yeah. no. And, and Rita, Rita was the minister. She married my wife and I. Yeah. Um, and, and that was, that was a hoot. That was funny. <laughs> um, and, and, and that was before I quit drinking. So, I mean, yeah, that there was, there was beer in the chapel. I mean, it was, it was straight up. A, in fact, I remember, <laughs> I remember walking up, uh, you know, waiting on Elizabeth to come up the little trail. We, we got married at a place called Chapel, uh, Chapel Dulcina. That's what it is. Um, down in uh, Dripping Springs or Driftwood. It was. It's over there by the Salt Lake. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. It's at this place called the Wizards Academy. Um, which I don't know what the Wizards Academy is, but it's kind of <laughs> like a. It kind of looks like Hogwarts. <laughs> um, but they have this chapel on top of a hill, and it's half indoor, half outdoor. You know, there's no doors in it. It's kind of an open air chapel. Um, and it's at the highest point there and all around you, it's just this big panoramic view of the hill country. I think I've been and, there uh, for a wedding. Actually. Yeah. It's, it's gorgeous. It was amazing. But I, I walked up, you know, I, I'm in the chapel. I'm waiting for, for Elizabeth to walk up and I'm smoking a cigarette. <laughs> and Rita's, <laughs> Rita's like, are you going to smoke during your wedding? <laughs> like, no, 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 no. This ain't a Jeff Foxworthy joke. I promise. <laughs> or it's like and, Dale, uh, Dale Gribble on King of the Hill where he's in the shower, still smoking <laughs> with his cap on. <laughs> 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 but yeah, it, it was fun. And you know, Rita, of course, you know, she got right down. You know, she was very much business like, you know, during during the ceremony and everything. But uh she got back on Coke FM the weekend after it happened, and nobody at the station knew that she was a minister. So Eric Rain <laughs> was like, Who in the hell gave you a license to be a minister? What? And uh it, so that that part was funny. And, um, and then, and then she's sitting there talking and blah, 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 blah. She goes, yeah, yeah. It's Jared and Elizabeth. It was my first straight wedding. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> but she just, it's just Rita. You just accept her, but yeah. Okay. But, but she is the biggest sweetheart as much as she doesn't like people or, or like being around people. You know, she's very much a, let me have my space kind of person. She is the biggest sweetheart in, in yeah. radio. I absolutely love her. I love follow. Of course, Ray Wiley's hysterical, and his responses are are what's so funny. Um, the, the stuff that he retweets from his fans and then comments on, and and you can always tell w when Ray writes the tweet, it's in all lowercase letters. <laughs> there's no capitals. You know, there's no it, the, the sentence structure is completely not proper. Um, it's it's an all lowercase. Uh, when somebody else 
uh, you know, logs into his page and sends out tweets, that's when you get like the proper punctuation and everything. So yeah. <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> kind of how to know it's management. <laughs> exactly. Um, and congratulations on Ray, you know, uh, signing with big machine. That's pretty bad. Oh yeah. Uh, he's somebody yeah, I need but, to get on here once I've got a few episodes under the belt, but I, I need to make sure I read his book first. Cause I don't ever want to bring on a guest where I don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I've, no, heard, yeah, I've we, heard interviews like that and I'm like, why did this happen? The book itself, the book you can sit down and read in one sitting. It's not long. It's easy to follow. It's got some of the best advice you're, you'll ever receive you know, in the music business and in life in general. The book is absolutely amazing. I like big print um, and pictures. So yeah, that's, that's there, my- <laughs> there's big prints, and I think there's pictures. Oh, Michael White, it, it's a personal account. Um, but my buddy, Michael White, one of my co-writers, he is hysterical. So on Facebook, uh, on my personal page i follow him his personal page and the stuff he he writes is absolutely just hysterical when he uh when he found out spotify was going to double their royalties you know for april uh he went on a rant i didn't even know they were doing that that shows you how much pay attention i pay to my spotify i don't know if it's true or not i kind of <laughs> looked it up today because i, I i'll have I, I got 13 songs going back to spotify april 17th and so I was curious. So I, I was trying to look it up today, but I couldn't find anything on it. So it might have just been a rumor. Well, if so, I'll make uh, a I'll make a dime in April instead of a nickel. That'll be nice. Right, right. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I can buy a pack of ramen noodles and a can of sardines. Yeah, so be awesome. For I anyone you- listening that doesn't know this, one of the funniest things when I first met Jared, he would do a Spotify pool every year. <laughs> Take the royalties you get from Spotify and, and install a pool in the backyard. And it's like a kiddie pool. <laughs> Yeah, I'm doing that again this year. Nice. <laughs> and that, honestly, that's well. Number one, I I can't hold. So many people get their music that way now. I mean that that is like the number one platform yeah. of people getting their music. And Ray told me, yeah, you know, he said, man, just just give them a little bit, but don't give them everything. And that's what Ray did. You know, he mm-hmm. didn't give them everything. And uh, so I picked thirteen. Uh, I call them. They're not my greatest hits. They're my greatest misses. I picked thirteen. <laughs> songs and and so they're going to get them but I, I also did it because i miss doing the spotify pool reveals every year oh um, yeah you know, what we, and you know what kitty pool am i going to get this year and, <laughs> and uh so so yeah i'll be doing that again this year is near misses a greatest misses no not thought about putting <laughs> that on there but but yeah that, that's and the way ray put it you know he, he you know give him you know yeah give him the stuff that went to radio you know that's cool and he's got a little way he does it where it leads into the website where it leads you know it, it, it leads people to explore more of your music um if you know if they like you enough i know and i'm one of them if i hear one song i really like i'm gonna go explore more yeah and you know, I'm, I'm gonna dig deep into the catalog i want to find out everything this person has and i want to you know, not so I can critique it. I just want to hear how this person has evolved as a writer and an artist. And there are people out there that do that. And okay, so they might get to my first album and hear Near Misses and like it, or hear Wish I Could, or or Easy Going, or you know those songs that that you know never made it to radio. And anyway, that's yeah, that's just kind of my method to, to that madness. Um, I'm still trying to think of pages I like to follow. I can't believe I'm locked in on that. Um, <laughs> See, the, the, the perfectionist in me guides people away from my early stuff because <laughs> I'm like, you know what? You can go ahead and just skip 2016. Go to my 2018 stuff. Well, man, you know, there's nothing. <laughs> um, oh, no. OK. Um, squirrel, something shiny. Uh, another page I like to follow is Bob Mennery, the the guy, the um he does all those comment. You know, he's he's got a great broadcaster's voice, but he'll take like his one of the latest videos he posted was two rats fighting in a grocery store. Oh, I've seen that. Yeah, and then he does. The, he's got this wonderful broadcast voice, but he he cusses. It's not for kids. No, it's not. <laughs> um, yeah, there, there, there's a parental you know advisory on this one, but they're hysterical. They're absolutely hysterical. I saw that today. Actually, somebody sent it to me over Facebook. It's funny. Yes, he he's got one. Um, uh, he's got one at a spelling bee. <laughs> <laughs> which is which is great i follow a lot of food pages oh yeah P- particularly like grilling pages like there's one called grilling fools uh one called yep. over the fire cooking uh sasquatch barbecue that dude out in washington i love his stuff um so yeah a lot of cooking pages a lot of cooking pages um those are the ones i check pretty religiously um, big fan the, of grilling fools because I mean they'll have like alligators with other animals in their mouth and all sorts amazing, of stuff on the grill. <laughs> and then my, oh, who ahead. else was it? Uh, obviously, meats and beats podcast with uh, 
T- you have to forgive me, Tony. I don't know Tony's last name, but uh, yeah. AJ Gale is the other host of that. And they yep. are hilarious. And uh, who's the other? There's like a third one I follow a lot. But oh, it was uh, Texas Bucket List. And oh, yeah. uh, Shane goes to a lot of burger places, food places, historical places that aren't even related to food. And yep. if I could do anything, I'd probably have his job. But mm-hmm. he actually got me going to this place in Waco called Captain Billy Whizbangs. And they literally oh, yeah. grind yeah, yeah. up, a, they grind bacon into their burger patty. So it's like a bacon yeah. burger without bacon on it. It's so good. Yeah, I'll actually do that. Um, I make sausage at home whenever I go hog hunting. I'll make link sausage. And some of the sausage I make, I'll grind up. I'll, I'll actually get, I'll get a pork belly and cure my own bacon. And then I'll grind that up and put it in the sausage mix. Oh, nice. Um, so that's, that's always a fun thing to do, but, but yeah, I, I love the food pages. Those are, I'm sorry. It took me so long to, to think about that, but yeah, that's really the core of what I check every day on social media is, is food pages. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kind of obsessed with them. And, uh, yeah, and and of course my you know, the music people that, that are on social media. So many of my, my heroes, um, if they're on social media, um, it's not them doing it. You know, it's a management company or, or a social media director, um, which is fine. I mean, it helps me you know keep up with their shows or if they have a new record coming out or a new single. But it's always fun when when uh, when when they access their accounts themselves. Yeah. Um, you know, that's that's what that's what me as a fan. You know, that that's what I really enjoy. Um, and that's one of the, one of the most fun things about doing what we do is being a fan of other people. Yeah. It's, it's going to see, you know, Travis Meadows at the Saxon pub or mm-hmm. going, going to see Ray Wiley Hubbard or, or going, you know, going to see you or going to see Stephen James. Okay. You can do your little soundbite thing. Um, <laughs> or, you know, that that's fun and, yeah. and supporting people and listening to their music and getting excited for them. And, uh, man, that's, that's, uh, that's just so much fun. I went to the, the Drew Fish songwriters retreat last year and, um, that was just so cool. There were so I made so many friends there. Uh, but you know, on top of Drew, you know, John Stork was there, uh, Bradley Banning, uh, I think Aaron Copeland was there. I wrote a song with Holly Tucker. Oh, cool. Um, uh, David Banning, who, you know, he's got a couple of Cody Jinx cuts. He's got, uh, he had two number ones. I think one was a Jamie Richards song. And then the next week, maybe Jody Booth had a number one and, and David Banning wrote them both. Um, and, and, but I'm fans of all these people. Yeah. And, and yeah, even, even if they're younger than me, I'm still a fan, you know, that, that has age has nothing to do with it. Yeah. So that, so this stuff, I really, really just get, get a kick out of, Is um, Bradley Banning it's a, lot of a DFW guy or did he live in Dallas recently? Yeah, yeah, he, yeah okay. him, and his, him and his dad both, they don't live you know, in the same house, but they both live in that area. I'm, if that's who I'm thinking of, I think he was actually almost on my album that I did in 2018, and he probably doesn't know this, but uh, I was recording with a guy named Johnny Philp, and Johnny kept saying, man, my friend Bradley needs to come play on this, my friend Bradley needs to come over, and uh, I think he was going to reach out, or there was something with the scheduling, I don't remember, but yeah, some guy named Bradley was going to be on my album, and I'm pretty sure due to the posts I've seen since then, I think that's who he was talking about. Great kid. And Justin. you mentioned Drew Fish. That's uh, I, I messaged back and forth with him a couple of days ago. I might have him here on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. He's, Hopefully. Drew's a great interview. And Drew, he's just goofy. I absolutely <laughs> love that guy. And, but he really does a lot for other people yeah. uh, in, te- in Texas music. You know, he really, um, and it's, t- it's to his advantage. You know, he's helping all these people. But he's also getting some great songs out of it. You know, he's, oh, he's yeah. getting these people together to write and, and, um, you know, the, this Coke FM virtual concert series that, that was Drew's brainchild, you know, with, huh. through all this stuff. And that was Drew's idea. Um, so yeah, I mean, Drew really does a lot for, you know, not just for Texas music, but for the folks in it. And he's still pretty young, yeah. you know, but, but, you know, by the time he's in his forties and fifties, um, you know, he's going to be pretty well established and, and, you know, he may be not an icon, uh, but he will definitely be, um, you know, j- just a, a major presence in Texas music. He already is. You know, he's got a couple yeah. number ones under his belt. Well, like the uh, other day when we did that live stream, whenever uh, Genevieve <laughs> Allen was on there and I told her, I was like, Hey, I really like that song boot Hill. She's like, yeah, I co-wrote it with drew fish. I was like, yeah, wow. Small world. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah Drew, Drew, Drew's making some, some waves because I mean, I think it was a year or two ago he played, I guess he was on TV before the Cowboys game. And, yeah. uh, for those of you who know me well, I'm a Texans fan. I kind of just tuned in to hear Drew and then I turned it back off. But 
Uh, Drew, Drew probably played better than the Cowboys did anyway. And yeah, it was it was for Thursday night football or Monday night football when the, when the Cowboys played the Texans. They had a they they had a Texas band and Drew filmed his stuff at Copeland Dance Hall. Oh, was that the then, Cowboys Texans game? No, it was or, Cowboys uh, Titans. Titans. Cowboys Titans. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, and then they had a Nashville band. You know, so so. Oh. And, and, and I think they filmed their stuff at Losers or something like that over <laughs> Nashville. But yeah, so it was like a back and forth. You know, you know, you know Texas is better. You know, yeah. da- you know, Dallas is the better team. You know, Nashville's a better team. Well, Texas music is better. You no, know, Nashville music is better. So it was, it was really cool how they played it up. Well, as a Texan um, fan, if that, I would have been rooting for the Cowboys that night. Then, <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it was really cool how the, how they how they did that. Um, and of course, you know, Drew, na- it was just naturally a perfect fit for it. you know he, yeah. he gets in front of a camera and he's got that raspy voice and that goofy smile and and he just you know you just can't help but love the guy that's just drew fish man He's, yeah I'm, that's who he is i'm definitely gonna have to have him on the show now he i went to his uh firehouse saloon show in houston the night before you and i played there for that benefit yeah and i mean yeah. he had it looked like a kiss concert there were all these lights smoke out on the stage he's the only artist yep. i've ever seen actually fill firehouse and i mean he put on a heck of a show and yep. uh to his credit you know you mentioned that drew does a lot for songwriters He's one of the people that actually kind of had me look at my music career and decide how seriously I was going to take it because I was, it was about a year after you and I met when Hurricane Harvey hit and I was at the relief concert over in Spring, Texas, and I got invited to go kind of into the VIP room with some people. And one of the people sitting at our table was Drew Fish, and this is actually where I met him. And he's like, so tell me about your music. I told him a little bit. He goes, so are you looking to do this as a career or is it just something you do for fun? And it, that should be an obvious question, but nobody had actually asked me before. Yeah. And any sensible person who does their hobby and their job would just blurt out, well, yeah, I want to do my hobby and get paid to do it. That should be the career. But, you know, yeah. the, re- the realistic side of me was like, oh, man, you know, you're on the spot. Answer honestly. And so I kind of paused for a second. And then I said, yeah, I'd love to do it as a career. And I thought, OK, once once I heard myself say it, that was kind of like the next step of take this seriously. Yep. You're in a room with Drew and Kyle Park and these guys like don't second guess yourself. He's built up, you know, his own production, you know, his own sound system. What, you know, you said it looked like a Kiss concert. That's all <laughs> Drew's stuff. That is yeah. all Drew's stuff. I mean, he has built that by himself. And uh which is amazing. And he's very hands-on. You'll see Drew, you know, Drew loads out, he loads in. Um, you know, he he built, you know, that drum riser they have. Drew built that. You know, he is so hands-on. Um, and just a humble guy. Tell me about this new single you're going to put out called that's as far as I'll go. I started writing that song kind of a long time ago. Um, and it just, it kind of stuck with me. Um, and a lot of songwriters will do this, you know, they'll, they'll start a song and kind of put it away. And and when they're hitting a dry spell, you know, they'll start pulling out the old stuff just to see if they can build on it. And that's what I did. Um, and, um, there really wasn't, there's really no story behind that song. Uh, it, I, I just wrote it because it, 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 sometimes you, you sit down with your guitar and you just start, you know, picking out this groove and you start putting words to it and it just feels good. You know what I mean? It just, yeah. you know, things just kind of roll off and, and it's just easy to sing and it's easy to play from the minute you start writing it. You know, there's no work involved at all. And that's kind of how this song was. Um, and so, you know, so the first verse in the chorus, you know, kind of came to me pretty good. And then I put it away and then I brought it back out again later. Um, and I started, you know, trying to finish it. And, and honestly, that's when a lot of the, um, a lot of those little double meanings came in. Yeah. yeah I, I was, I was able to step back and look at the song and, Oh, well, I could put that there and it could mean two things. And I could put that there and it would mean two things. And, and so that's where all that kind of started rolling in. And, and um, I got stuck on, on the second verse and I called Ron Avis who, who was my first publisher. Um, I wasn't uh, under his publishing at the time. I had bought all my stuff back, uh, but we still write together. And I, I, you know, I got a hold of him. And, and so he came up with those, like the first two lines in the second verse. And um, that uh, if I know her, she's probably southbound. She's got some friends down there where she can hide out. Um, and that just, that got me kickstarted to the rest of it. Um, and then when I brought it to the studio, I was still apprehensive because the song is so simple. Yeah. I mean, I mean, but it, you it, can rock it, to it. <laughs> yeah, but 
but I mean, if you start playing it in triplets, like the dun, 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 and you and you do the chords, it's it, it's a Buddy Holly melody. Is really huh. what it amounts to. I mean, that's just how simple this song is. And I'm I'm not downplaying what Buddy Holly did. Buddy Holly was a genius in his simplicity. Shout out to my Lubbock um, friends. Yeah, man. Shout out to Lubbock, man. I was just a, a a hidden gem in music in general. Um, but yeah, so it's really it's really a Buddy Holly type song. So when I brought it to the studio, I was apprehensive about it, and um, and uh, I Glenn Duncan. Glenn didn't play fiddle on that. He played the bazooki, which is a uh, it's a Greek instrument that's kind of a cross between a mandolin and a banjo. And uh, James Mitchell playing guitar. James is just a monster. He's a uh, he's a guy who fills in for Brent Mason when Brent can't do any work. Um, Charlie Judge playing the keyboards. I think in that it was either Charlie Charlie Judge or jimmy wallace and jimmy wallace plays keyboards for gavin mcgraw huh. um and paul scolton playing drums and don kears playing bass big don uh but yeah we were just sitting there and and um and those guys at, uh, those a-list players um if you want to know what a session is like you send them your work tapes you know and the work tape is just me and a guitar and and they have, they'll have interns that chart the songs and the charts are all numbers, you know, one, four, five, you know, diamonds, all that stuff. And, uh, so they'll have the charts ready and we get there. And, uh, before each song, we all gather in the control room and they'll play the work tape real quick while the musicians look at their charts and they'll listen to a verse and maybe half a chorus. And they're like, okay, let's go do this. And we jump in, we all jump into our respective booths and where, where I record it's live we record live there's very little tracking that goes on and um you know we get in the booth and uh and that and really that's all that happens i'm like okay crap what's this going to sound like and i had already i was you know i was tuned down to dad gad and i was ready to you know i was just going to do my little chunk and you know at the in the beginning so i'm like okay i'm going to do that let's just see what happens and and all of a sudden, you know, that Paul Scolton counts it off one, two, three, and and James Mitchell, he he took out his, uh, he's got like a fifty, uh, like a fifty-two telly or something like that. He's got a sixty-five Strat, and he's got this. Uh, I want to say it's a sixty-six or sixty-eight Les Paul and a couple other guitars. But he pulls out the Les Paul, and you know, Paul counts it off one, two, three, four, and then James, he just starts rocking it, and I was like. You know, I, I almost stopped and like threw my hands up in the air, you know. And so we 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 went through about half of it and we stopped, and then you know we got a few things in line and then we went through it once. Bam, done. Wow, they are one hundred percent live. And there's also a little. I don't know if you noticed in the beginning, it almost sounds like scratching in a rap track that sh- 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 that you hear. Yeah. Um, that was, and this is where, and Don Kears, this is where he, Don Kears produced my second album. Don is just goofy. <laughs> um, there was, whenever James was hitting a certain note, there was this like little rattle that would happen in the corner. And Don's like, wait, 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 stop. James hit that note again. And so James would hit the note and he heard the rattle and it was a snare. You know, Paul Scolton has like 13 different snares that he plays with and, and he's got them stacked up to the side uh, of his drum kit. And one of them was rattling. And and then Don's like, okay, sample that, sample that right now. Oh wow! And, and so Don, so okay, so they sampled that, and then Paul, and Paul listened to. It, he's like, okay, well, hang on. And he got out. Oh, you know those little shakers that have the beads around them. Yeah. So he gets he gets that out. And he and he gets up to his condenser mics that are over his drum kit, and and so he hits that, and he's like, no, that's not enough. And then he goes, wait a minute. So 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 he started hitting the little the whatever that thing is with the beads around it. And he was going as he was hitting it. And so they, they combined all that. And then Jimmy Doolin, the engineer who co-produced this thing with me, he's, he's the one who's like, man, this is going to sound a little weird, but what do you think of this? So he, uh, he's the one who made it sound like that little, that that you hear in the beginning. That's awesome. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's fun. It's fun, but th- those guys are so good. And, and those are the guys that you hear, you know, when you're listening to, even in Texas music, um, you know, so many of us, you know, sometimes they'll record half the album in Nashville, half here, um, whatever. But they, especially on, on top 40 radio, the guys that you hear playing are those guys. Um, you know, they're just they're just pros and, and uh, they make it so, so easy and so much fun. Uh, they actually let me play on the tracks, you know, which is uh, I'm not the greatest guitar player in the world, but my right hand is 
pretty steady, I guess. And uh, so, so, so they let me actually play on the tracks, you know, all the acoustic tracks, that's me playing. So, uh, but yeah, so that, that's the story behind that song. I know we, I took the long way around to get there, but the, no, the studio, cool. the studio part of it is so much fun for me. Um, just hearing a song come to life. And there's so many times that I've brought a song into the studio that, and, and songwriters, you know, you know, the definition of a songwriter, uh, what is it? A, uh, an egomaniac with an inf- inferiority complex. <laughs> um, you know, so, so we bring these songs to the studio. We're unsure of them. Uh, but then these guys get a hold of it and just bam, you know, they just erase all doubt. And uh, that's just so, so much fun for me to be able to do that. Awesome. Well, I'm going to play that song here. And this is called That's As Far As I'll Go. Hey man, am I glad I found you I got a chase that I need to cut to No time to talk about the tears in my eyes I hate to ask but I need a favor There's a lot of ground I need to cover And I'm getting nowhere fast in this wreck I drive I know this GTO's your prized possession But it would help me with the bind that I'm in Just hear me out before you tell me no I can't afford a long explanation But she took off and my heart is breaking I'm worried about the state she's in And that's as far as I'll go Daylight is burning and I've got to try to go as fast as I can because time can fly when you're trying to reach the one you no longer hold. I'm the one that drove her away. I've got to turn her around before it's too late. A million miles might be what it takes. That's as far as I'll go If I know her, she's probably southbound She's got some friends down there where she can hide out She always said that's where she would like to go And she ain't one to stop at sundown compliments i've got to pay real quick before moving on one is to don because uh i've played bass on some of your songs when we were going to rehearse in that band format a year or two ago and uh the the thing i hated the first couple times i ran through these songs on empty pillow and uh you just don't know it yet which we'll play later those climbs i was like man what did this guy do but 
as soon as I kind of figured it out, you know, by the end of the second or third day of just kind of running through some stuff, I was like, man, these are cool songs. So as a bass player, I was like, this is a lot of fun to do. And even then I was only doing like 70% of what he did. I mean, he was doing some funky stuff that was like, okay, this guy knows what he's doing. Yeah. Uh, Don is, is, um, yeah, he's accomplished. He, uh, yeah, he's an old rock and roll guy, but yeah, he, he's a very, he's a, an accomplished bass, uh, jazz bass player. Um, he plays in a band with, um, oh golly, the guy that he writes with Walt Wilkins all the time. And I cannot think of the guy's name, but he, he plays an upright bass in that band. And, um, yeah, he, he's a lot of fun. He is just a lot of fun. And, and the stuff that you hear, especially like on, on she don't know it yet and empty pillow. Um, if you listen to those licks, um, it was fun having Don and then Glenn Duncan playing fiddle on those songs. Uh, because Glenn also played, um, on a lot of Daryl Dallas old stuff. Oh yeah. And, and so did Don. So if you listen to like, like Pearl snaps that, you know, the, the, especially during the chorus, you know, the bass walking he does is basically the same run that is in, she just don't know it yet. Um, and so it's fun to listen to that. And then of course that, um, uh, that, uh, and Daryl's song, uh, bitter end in the very first, uh, studio version at Sony. Um, Glenn does a triple, a triple fiddle solo. It's tri fiddles. It's not dual. It's tri, and that is just amazing. And Glenn did the same thing, basically the same thing, at the beginning of "Is It Just Me," which is on the new record. Oh yeah. Um, so it's it's, but it's it's so fun just watching those guys work. And sometimes, um, sometimes I I get stuck. Like and she don't know it yet, which you'll you see you're going to play later. Uh, James Mitchell in the second verse does this guitar run um that made me i i had to stop and, and i had to retract my acoustic guitar um when he did that run <laughs> it was just <laughs> it was uh, i'd never seen anything like it and uh so yeah they will do stuff that will screw me up uh just because it's so good well i, I screw myself up being half good and then have to retune the guitar of a couple songs so you know what that's ahead of me but one thing the other compliment i mentioned I had a couple compliments the other would be if if i could only pay you one compliment as a musician the one I'd go with would be the fact that you're really good at writing double meanings, whether it's long way from OK or where you're coming from or the one you just talked about. I mean, it's like a lot of your songs have that double meaning. And heck, the one you played on live stream the other day, the uh, heart on my sleeve. <laughs> I, uh, I, I believe I do not have that one queued up for this podcast, but at, all those songs are really great at just conveying that double meaning. And that, I don't know, that's just a really cool ability as a songwriter. That's kind of my wheelhouse, and that was uh, that was Ron Avis is doing. Man, Ron Ron was the the king of, of and he still is. Uh, he's not really writing anymore, but all the like that the first cut that he had with um, his very first cut was with Daryl Singletary. Oh and yeah, and it was rest in it peace. Was a, yeah, it was a song that him and Randy Travis wrote with Jerry Foster, the great jerry freaking foster yeah and this was this was ron's first co-write with jerry foster and ron brought in he just he was just a word man he didn't play guitar nothing he was just strictly a word man and he brought in these lyrics uh and the song was there's a cold spell moving in and uh and it maybe not so much of a double meaning but um there's one song we wrote called uh called afterwards and it's about you know this going out on a date with a girl and then when the date's over you're thinking about her afterwards you know what she's saying what are her after words and so you know there's that double meaning um there's another song that he wrote with randy uh that's that i've got in the catalog now it's called it's called after all um where he starts out the the songs uh saying you know after all the time we spent thinking that and giving mine uh, you would see me differently, but I guess you're not that kind. Well, there's another double meaning, or I guess you're not that kind. Yeah. Um, uh, but but then in the chorus, it, it swings around into, um, I can't justify hanging around. I never had a chance, girl, after all. You know, and so Ron was just, uh, got another one he wrote with Randy called Don't Leave Me This Way. Uh, in the first verse, um, you know, he's talking, it's her, you know, packing up and leaving. And he's just saying, hey, don't, you know, don't leave me this way. And then in the second verse, it's basically him, you know, down on his knees, you know, just in, in a bad mental state. And he's saying, hey, don't leave me this way. Um, so, yeah, Ron was just uh, I could go on and on about the double meanings, but that really stuck with me. 
Um, and I really have to fight that sometimes. Uh, uh, Chris Lacey over at Warner Brothers. I knew Chris when she was in pub in War at Warner Chapel Publishing. She was a, a rep there. And then a couple of years later, she worked her way up to an A&R rep, uh, you know, where she was, you know, taking submissions from from me as a songwriter and you know, pitching them to other artists and stuff like that. Now, Chris is second in command at all of Warner Brothers. The only person she answers to is Scott Hendricks. And uh, Chris Lacey always told me that, that your songs are too hooky. They're just too hooky. And I'm like, well, that's the way I write, you know, and, <laughs> and um, I'm a you hooker. Know, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and that, that was when, you know, Blake Shelton was cutting, you know, some beach. Okay. Come on. That's not hooky. Yeah. And, 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 and again, not ripping on that song. Uh, Rory Feek was a co-writer on that song. And Rory oh, yeah. is, he's a wonderful songwriter. Um, and it was clever. I liked it. I liked it. So, you know, I'm like, you're going to tell me I'm too hooky and, and you just can't take that stuff personal. Um, and sometimes, yeah, I just have to embrace that. Okay. That's my wheelhouse. That's my, I guess that's my gift, but it is fun when I can write a song like, like she calls me daddy. That is, that is not hooky. It's just straightforward. Yeah. You know, it, it I say what I want to say and, um, it has a tendency to resonate with people better than a lot of the other songs that I wrote. Has um, anybody, so, ha, have you heard from anyone that's used that as like the father daughter dance at their wedding? Cause that just sounds oh, like one yeah. that would yeah, happen. I, I get that a lot. Um, I'll get messages or emails probably, you know, once a week, once every other week of, you know, Hey, can we use this song? Or, um, you know, I, I don't know where to find it, you know, so I'll send them, you know, whatever, I'll send them a wave file of it. Uh, but yeah, that happens a lot. And actually there was, um, that song in particular, uh, when I was, golly, I guess I was 20 when I met my first wife, she was older than me by a year or two. And she, Monica was a year and a half old or about a little over a year old at that time. So when we had decided to get married, you know, I was going to take on this, this little girl. I was clueless. You know, I was 20, 21 years old getting married and I was going to have to like take care of a, a, a baby, a toddler. You know, I had yeah. no idea what I was doing. And Sherry got me this book called She Calls Me Daddy. And I don't know where that book is, but uh, it was the one of the biggest helps I ever had, particularly about building memories with with Monica and then eventually Michaela when she came along. Um, there there are things that we did because of that book that we still talk about today. You know, you know, Monica is 23 years old. Michaela's 21. And we still talk about the things that we did. And I, the only reason I did them was because of that book. Um, and the author that wrote that book, I found him on social media. Oh, cool. And and I sent him the little lyric video I did where you know, where the fans sent in their pictures, you know, girls sending pictures of them with their dad or, or dads were sending in pictures of them with their little girl, you know, stuff like that. And uh, so I sent him that video and then he shared it. Um, and we actually struck up a friendship. And he uh, he sent me a, a another book that he uh, that he wrote that I'm going to read. Well, this is the whole thing's going on, but it's called "She Still Calls Me Daddy," and it's about um, you know the relationship with your daughter when they become adults and get married and stuff like that. So, um, but yes, yeah, so, so that that's where I got the title for that song. It just I, when I started writing it, you know, Monica had just turned 16. I was in a terrible relationship. And, and, uh, my addiction was in full swing. So I, you know, I, I couldn't make it to her 16th birthday party and, uh, and I felt terrible about it. So I started writing this song and the whole, she calls me daddy thing just fit in there naturally. Um, and I put that, I put that song on YouTube real quick. And I think that version is, I think the night I wrote it, that version is still up. Um, and I put it on her Facebook page and all that stuff, embarrassed the snot out of her, <laughs> even not she would not talk to me for like three months and <laughs> she, she likes the song now though, because it's on, you know, it's, it gets played on the radio once in a while. So now she's cool with it. But, but back then, <laughs> back then it was a big embarrassment, but that's, you know, that, that's what you're supposed to do as a father. You know, if you don't embarrass your children, then, then you're probably not doing something right. Yeah. Some of your songs have some great backstories. And so one that I want to throw out there before playing our second songs, uh, I mentioned earlier that the first show you and I did together was an Elgin and yeah. As you were mentioning how you're, you know, working to kick cigarettes and all that. I don't think I've ever been in a room that was more smoke filled than that room. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and that's amazing. It, yeah, we're sitting there and 
Jared has a song called uh, Raising Humans. And mm-hmm. when you look at that title, you think, oh, it's about a parent raising kids, but it's not. Yeah. And it's about dogs and it's a really heartfelt song. And so Jared starts playing it. And there's a guy in the room, an older gentleman who has his dog with him. It may have been like a service dog or something. I don't remember. And you could tell it was one of those guys. He was by himself. You could tell his dog was like his companion dog was it meant a lot to him. The dog walked up to where we were sitting, sat right in front of the monitor, listened to the song. Yeah. Like ears went back and uh, the song, I won't spoil it for our audience, but it, I'll just say that it ends kind of the same way any book or movie about dogs does and yep. uh, read between those lines. But as that verse started to hit, the uh, I looked up and the man had a tear in his eye where he was sitting and he looked sad and the dog turned around and went and just kind of like sat at the man's feet and the dog was crying. And I was like, Jared Johnson just made a dog cry. That is a first. <laughs> I've never seen that happen at a show. And... Yeah, uh, your wife and my wife were sitting together, and it was, and you know, Hannah looks at me, she's like, "Wow, you know, that was yep. that was crazy. That just happened." So yep. that was a definitely a memorable moment, and so I I would recommend the audience go listen to Raising Humans, especially especially anyone that's a d- a dog lover. Yeah, and, that and that song, I like to brag on that song because I didn't write it. You know, that yeah, was, that was you know, so, so I can when I say it's the best song I've ever heard about about dogs, it's to me, it's better than Feed Jake, and that's a great song. Um, yeah, that is, it's the greatest dog song that's ever been written. And I won't give too much away, but it's written from the dog standpoint. Yeah. And um, Michael White, the guy that wrote it, uh, Michael's a great friend, and, you know, one of the guys I like to follow on social media. Um, Michael, uh, his, Michael's dad um, was a guy named L.E. White, and L.E. was a great musician. Um, he played fiddle for Bill Monroe for a little while. He played for Conway Twitty for years. And he, Ellie wrote 69 Conway Twitty cuts. Nice. 69. Nice. And so, so Michael's pedigree is pretty good. And Michael had a little record deal back in the nineties, you know, back, back when you, you know, you tucked in your shirts and your jeans came up, you know, past your belly button. And, you know, he had long hair, he had the mullet like I did. And, um, and, uh, you know, he had some great songs on there, but Michael wrote, um, the first time he ever wrote with the late Harley Allen, who one of the greatest songwriters ever lived and Har- Harley and I never got a chance to write. Um, uh, we would hang out. I would bring my daughters over to his place when they were little to have play dates and all that stuff. But Harley and I never got to write. But the first time Michael wrote with Harley Allen, they wrote the baby, the song that Blake Shelton cut and made such a big hit. Um, and I don't know if you remember that song, uh, but it's about the, um, you know, the mother always saving him because he was the baby. Um, and then of course at the, at the end of the song, you know, mom's passing away and she kisses and he kisses her. And I softly kissed that lady and cried just like a baby. I mean, it's just, Oh, it's just such a good heartfelt song. And, uh, he wrote, um, by the light of a burning bridge for George Strait, um, gone before you met me for Alan Jackson. You know, Michael's had some, some pretty, pretty good hits, but when I heard this song, um, it was, you know, it was about his dog, Max, and I, I'm not going to give it away anymore, but M- Michael was sitting on his little front porch swing, and uh, he, he looked, up the, looked up to the sky and said, okay, Max, how would you write this song? So he, so he gives Max credit for writing the song, and um, uh, just, a, just a wonderful song, and uh, when I cut it, I asked Michael, I'm like, I, I, know, I know George Strait's interested in this song, Easton Corbin wants it, can I cut it? He's like, yeah, man, go ahead. So I cut it and I was going to release it. I tried to release it as a single back in 2018 or it might've been last year. Um, I tried to release it as a single and I got a cease and desist from Easton Corbin's management company. <laughs> <laughs> um, Cause Easton had cut the song. Yeah. Um, well, he, he had cut the song on when he was on universal. And for some reason or another, after he cut that song, he lost his record deal. Hmm. So he had to go back in and re-record the song. Um, and he released, he released it as in, you know, on his, by himself, you know, basically what I do. Um, and poor Michael, um, you know, that song, he, Michael's the only writer on that song. He has most of the publishing on it. That song could have made Michael a killing. And, but when Easton released it, you know, it was, uh, you know, it, it, you never heard the song on the radio. Yeah. 
You never did. But if you look up Easton Corbin's version, it's amazing. I mean, Easton really, he's a great singer. You know, he just, he knocked it out of the park on that song, but you know, he didn't, he didn't have the record label, didn't have, you know, the promotions team and all that other stuff. So, so the song just, it went nowhere. And I, it's, I, I hate that because the song is so good. I really hope, I really hope beyond everything that somebody with some clout, you know, some big name and not just in Texas, but, you know, nationally, you know, it, it could be Florida Georgia line. Florida Georgia line can cut that song because Michael White deserves that paycheck. You know what I mean? <laughs> he does. He does. Michael White deserves that. And and since then, after that happened, Michael hasn't wrote. He's he's kind of alluded to the fact that he's just going to reti- you know he's retiring. He's done with it. Um, and uh, so I feel really bad for that. But all, all that to say, if you don't listen to my version of Raising Humans, go listen to Easton Corbin's version of Raising Humans. It and, is, and do it before Florida Georgia Line makes dogs cry for another <laughs> reason. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, it, and but, you've got yeah. a point. Like for the longest time, I thought you wrote it because the first time I ever heard it was in Elgin whenever the dog cried. So I was like, man, yeah. that's awesome. All right. Well, on a funnier note, going from sad to hilarious, I'm going to play this next song. And what I usually try to do is have the guest tell me what they're working on, play a new song. And then I pick the next one, whether it's an old one, new one or whatever. And yeah. what we're going to do here is she just don't know it yet because, like I said, it's hilarious. <laughs> You are falling that good looking thing in the produce I can't blame you You're jealous of the peaches she's been squeezing Man, I know you wish it could be you Ain't that the truth I'm not a jealous man I wouldn't hurt a soul But before you make your move You need to know so crazy about me She just can't live without me She thinks that I must be heaven sent She's in love, she just don't know it yet Never mind the fact that she hangs up on me Each and every time I call I called to kiss me, smile that night last week when she called me a stalker. That girl is such a sweet talker. I won't give up, cause there's hope yet. I kinda like a girl who plays hard to get. Oh, she's so crazy about me. She just can't live without me She thinks that I must be heaven sent She's in love, she just don't know it yet Two weeks ago I asked her what my chances are And she said there was none are looking up because last night she told me a million to one oh and she's so crazy about me she just can't live without me she thinks that i must be heaven sent she's in love she just don't know it yet That girl's in love She just don't know it yet Hey man, you see that look she gave me? Nah, she only gives that look to me No, that ain't a dirty look <laughs> She wants me well, it was Brad Heitman when he was at KSTP in Stephenville. He he called it the Texas Country Stalker song. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, that's that's funny. Of all your songs, which three mean the most to you? Um, obviously, she calls me daddy. Uh, yeah, just because it's it's about my girls. Uh, I, I wrote it for Monica's birthday, but it's it's about it's about my daughters. You know, I, I can't you can't just single one out. Um, and that song, like I said earlier, it just seems to resonate with people a little more than the other stuff that I write. Um, it has more of an appeal. You know, a lot of us have daughters and every single daughter has a daddy somewhere. You know what I mean? And so that, that song really resonates with people and it's, it's near and dear to me. It's one of those songs that I'm always proud to play. Um, closer than they appear. Uh, again, that, that song's simple. Um, not a whole lot to it. The chords are easy. Um, and I've recorded it twice. It's on my first record. Um, very big, uh, very big sound. Um, uh, Glenn Duncan does some, some really spooky mandolin stuff on there. And, and, uh, James Mitchell pulls out some blues tone on that guitar. That is just, just haunting. So I really enjoy that song. Um, and then, I've, then I did it on my second record, just straight acoustic with Glenn Duncan playing the fiddle. Um, but that's just, it's, that song's just personal. Um, I was in a, not in a very good spot when I wrote it. Um, and it was just one of those, uh, and it was, it was about my addiction. Um, you know, running, constantly running from my past and no matter how far I run from it, I look in the rear view mirror and it's still there. And, uh, and like the little sign says on the, the objects are closer than they appear. Um, and that was just kind of a point where I just, I was saying, okay, I got to deal with this. You know, there's one that I don't ever play live. It's called run to ruin. Um, it's country. It's, 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 uh, it's reminiscent of the old left your Frizzell song that Keith Whitley did. Uh, I never go around mirrors and, and the hook in that song is, um, if you take the word run and you put the letter I in there, it becomes ruin. So the hook is I was all it took to go from run to ruin. Um, but it's, it's just a really slow, you know, steel guitar driven uh country song and it's, it's sort of a tribute to merle haggard um that the last line of the second verse says, uh, i think enough has been said it's time to give this jukebox a whirl look i'm feeling mighty haggard i need to hear some merle and i like uh, that yeah so it, and that man phil meredith sang the demo on it i've got one with buddy jewel singing the demo as well uh but phil uh phil was pretty young back then when he did that demo uh as he would, um, oh, for lack of a better word, he always makes the joke. Uh, my balls hadn't dropped yet. Sorry if you got to use the the button, but <laughs> but, he, but he always makes that joke. So so he sounds really young in the demo, but it's it's he's really delivers it, and uh, it's just a it's to me it, it, the most quintessential country song I've wrote. And I'm not saying it is the quintessential country song. I'm saying for me. Um, you know, the, one of the most country songs I've probably wrote was that song. And I'm just, I'm really proud of that song. That's awesome. Well, um, I'm actually going to play closer than they appear here in a second, because I like to highlight any song that artists have used for a music video. Yours truly got to be a part of this video. And that was a lot of yeah. fun. Or as I tell people, Garrett's creepy shadow got to stand at the back of the room. <laughs> if yeah, you I see bad, a tall, man. lanky figure in a cowboy hat, that's me. Um, no, I don't feel bad. It was, it was a blast to do. And, uh, yeah. Anyone that heard episode one, RJ Paxson is the guy sitting in the chair trying to throw Jared off the wagon. And uh, actually, when <laughs> this is awful, but when you went to rehab, uh, RJ texted me and I don't think he realized you'd gone to rehab. And he's like, hey, did we ever get to see that music video that Jared did? I'm like, no, idiot. You threw him off the wagon. <laughs> <with> the- nice. <laughs> and so, that is awesome. And uh, that video has also got uh, Drew Fish, as we mentioned earlier, and uh, Ray yep. Wiley Hubbard as well. So, yep. A little. Good old cast of characters in that thing. And then, of course, ba- and, Baby's in it. Yeah, Baby's in it, the 76 Bronco, and, and some of the worst boys at, at Solstice Recovery. You know, shout out to Solstice. Uh, yeah, th- and that was that was fun to do there because those guys are, um, they're crazy. The whole <laughs> bunch of them are nuts. And 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 the guys that come in for the first time, uh, you know, that are just, you know, they're, they just detoxed off of either alcohol or it could be heroin or or meth, you know, meth, crack, everything, you know, they're just a bundle of nerves. And after about three weeks of being there, they're just as crazy as the rest of them. <laughs> and, um, so, so getting them to be serious was such, it was terrible. I can't, 
at the, at the beginning, like when we're doing that little group thing and you know, we're trying to be serious and all that stuff, it was a lot of fun. And then, yeah, getting Ray to do it was really cool. And we'd, we'd gone back and forth. You know, Ray has gotten so busy now. He is busier now than he has been in his entire career. Oh, he played the Opry finally. He played State yeah, he played- Farm. I'm like, that's probably the most country thing that place has heard in a while. Yeah, yeah, he, that, that, which was amazing. I'm so proud of him for doing that. And, and uh, he, he, uh, you know, he got that record deal with a big machine. The record's already done. You know, he's he's had the record done for a little while. Um, he was doing some shows with the Cadillac Three, and is it uh, God, who's the lead, is it Jaron who's the lead singer? I can't remember his name. Uh, but he was talking to Ray about you know big machine and you know Scott and all those people and. And, uh, he's like, well, well, let me, let me hook you up. And, and, uh, so Ray went to Nashville, did a showcase and they signed him. And really the record as Ray recorded it is what they're releasing. They just mastered it a little bit more. Um, so yeah, I mean, so, so the record's done. This is, this is not a big machine record. This is Ray's record that big machine is distributing basically. That's cool. Um, which is amazing. That's, and that's, who could ask for anything more as an independent artist than that to happen? Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, you, you got big machines, you know, worldwide network to work with on a record you did. You know, that's that's Ray's baby. Those are Ray's songs, you know, Ray's production. That is that is Ray's baby. And he's what, 73, 74 years old right now? That's and he so finally cool. he finally yeah, he's been sober now for I want to say 34 years. Um uh, it's it. And he says it in his book. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not a, I don't feel bad saying this, but I mean, Stevie Ray Vaughn is the one who, as we say, 12 stepped Ray Wiley Hubbard. Oh, wow. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, so this is awesome for Ray and really, uh, in sobriety, you know, that's what I have to look forward to. Um, wow. you know, Ray has built a slow, when, when Ray first got sober, uh, he had one gig once a week. Uh, it was in between lingerie shows at the airport lounge in Dallas, <laughs> Texas. That's all. And he had that, that was all he had for a year. And, uh, and look at him now, you know yeah. what I mean? It, it took him a while. And, and it was funny that I, I want to say it was the first album that he did after he sobered up. You know, he hadn't done a record in like eight or nine years. And, you know, trust me, I know when, when you're drunk all the time, you cannot do a record. <laughs> it's just not in the cards. <laughs> So he finally did a you know, he finally did a record and he said it was the first one that um, he could give people and not have to explain himself. Yeah, and that's kind of how I feel about El Paso. I, I the last record I explain I explained a lot just because yeah, I didn't use auto tune on purpose. Um, you know, it was it was all acoustic. It was you know there was really nothing. I, I did that record more for me than anything. Yeah. Um, but you know, when I was sending songs out to radio or even when I, even when people buy it, you know, they're willing to spend 15 bucks to buy a hard copy. And here I am explaining it to them. This record, I really don't feel the need to do that. Um, you know, it's like, okay, here it is. That's what it is. Uh, if you like it, you know, I hope you like it. Uh, but no, the, the production's good. The mastering's good. Um, you know, yeah, it's, it's a little bit modern, but these are all songs that other people have passed on. Um, so I thought that, I thought that was a cool idea for a record. Okay. What about all these songs that either other, other artists had on hold or, uh, you know, I had pitched them to them, but they passed on them. Well, let's, let's put some of these songs together and call it a record. And, uh, the very last song on the record though, I did keep as a work tape. Um, and I'm not really even going to explain that to people, but it's, it's the work tape. Um, I recorded it in a motel six bathroom, um, on my phone. and. Uh, it was right after, um, you know, Aaron Kothman had passed away. Uh, he was only 30. He had just turned 36 and he, he died of liver failure. His organs shut down. Um, yes, he was diabetic, but, uh, you know, he, he had problems sobering up. Let's just put it that way. And, uh, and I was, I was really sad about it. And so I wrote that song, uh, about him and I, I felt bad for his wife and everything. And, um, and then it's just kind of morphed into, you know, my tribute to all of, I've lost 23 friends in the last couple of years, Jeez. either, you know, either, you know, to a relapse or, um, you know, to, uh, suicide, um, you know, as a re- as a result of being an addict, you know, just it's, yeah, I, I don't want to overshadow what, obviously what's going on now with COVID-19. 
Yeah. Um, you know, this, that, that absolutely has to be taken seriously. Um, but addiction is just kind of a, uh, yeah, there's that negative stigma, you know, it's bad choices. Well, it's, you know, they died, they overdosed, they chose to do that, blah, 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 blah. So it, it doesn't really get, um, again, there's a lot of resentment around when an addict or an alcoholic dies, you know, there's just, a, when somebody from cancer dies, you know, there's, you know, there's sadness, um, but there's really no resentment. Right. Um, when somebody with addiction dies or in their addiction and they die, there's that resentment. Um, so yes, yeah, so, I mean, it, it, it's hard to, uh, you know, just, tr- you know, just trying to bring awareness to what a problem it is. Um, because there are so many resentments out there, uh, you know, just around addiction. Um, yeah. so, so yeah, so I mean that, but th- that's something near and dear to me and something that, uh, I, I hope, um, I'm not going to curb it. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to stop it. And there's nothing I can do, but I hope that and even, even anybody listening to this, if you think you have a problem, you know, call me, you know, go hit me up on social media. I will give you my phone number. We can talk and we can, you know, we can get you help. You know, there's ways to do it that don't cost money. Um, if it does cost money, most people are going to work with you. You just have to want it. That's the only thing. Yeah. You know, addiction's kind of funny. It's one of the only diseases that, that you diagnose yourself. I mean, the, the people around you can diagnose you, obviously. I mean, if you saw me drinking when I was drinking, okay, yep, he's, he's an alcoholic. He's got it. Uh, but before you can do anything about it, you have to accept it yourself. You have to diagnose yourself. Um, so it's, it's unique in that way, but anybody willing to reach out for help? Um, yeah, I'm going to, it's, it's my duty. You know, I, I can't keep what I've got through sobriety unless I at least attempt to give it away. Yeah. Um, and you know, it doesn't, you know, there's guys that I try to help all the time and, and, you know, 99 times out of a hundred, it doesn't take on the first time, you know, they'll, they'll relapse or they'll just say, Oh, this isn't for me or whatever. Um, it's just like the music business. There are, there's 99 no's before you get that first. Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, addiction's the same way, but you know, I've got to keep doing it. Uh, even if it doesn't, even if it doesn't work, even if that person doesn't get it, um, if I'm not trying to do it, then I'm, I'm not going to be able to, you know, I'm not going to keep it unless I at least try to give it away. So that's my little spiel on that. <laughs> well, I'm, I for one, cause I met you before, you know, your most recent rehab stint and, uh, yeah. or recent couple, you know, I, I've known you for, I guess, four years now. And yeah, I've, been, I've I mean, been in three times. Yeah. Well, four, no, four, four. Cause I went to, I went back to Cumberland Heights in Nashville too. Well, I'm, so, I yeah. remember like, I mean, I'm, seeing that happen and knowing you personally, it's I'm, I'm proud of you and I'm happy for you. And I think it's really great that you put that music video out because there could be people you never interact with, never know exist that might've seen it. And even something as simple as that could have helped them. And you never know, even if they never reach out to you, that could prompt them to reach out to somebody else. And so I think videos like that are really important. And and the purpose, and and the purpose of getting obviously drew and, and we were on one of Granger Smith's buses, we, Drew and I, you know, for our little scene. And, and then, of course, getting Ray in there. Um, it was, yeah, it was cool. It, it was, it's a good little promotional tool for me. I'll admit that. Um, especially with Ray, you know, there is somebody that's been there. Yeah. You know, that, that, that is the guy who I call. And I have other people that I call, too. But when I, when I was first trying to get this right, um, he was the guy I would call when I was having trouble. And Drew Fish is very well aware of my problems with addiction. And and he's just been a huge help in just the fact that he's been there and willing to understand. The purpose of bringing these people in there was more more so that, okay, look, I'm in the music business. These people know about my problem. There's nothing wrong with that. I was hoping that that would be more inviting uh, than it would be um, a, oh, look at me. I've got you know Drew Fish and Ray Wiley Hubbard in a video, whatever. Yeah, that's... I I was, I mean, that's really, you know, the, the the bare bones of that video is, Hey, I have this problem. Other people know I have the problem. One of the guys that helped me with my problem is in this video, you know, let's all, you know, I can help you too, or I can at least point you in the right direction. So that was, uh, kind of the purpose of, of all those little cameos and stuff in that video. Awesome. Well, I'm going to play that for everyone here. Now this is called closer than they appear.
I sure could use a brand new suitcase For all the baggage I have these days I'd like to know just where I'm going But what the hell's the use in knowing I'll just park and lay across the seat And close my eyes but I can't sleep And I'm so sick and tired of running I thought what I needed was the past in my rear view mirror but I chose to ignore the writing Now every time I look I see it clear Things are closer than they appear I have tried to start a new life But there are some things that I can't hide Just when I think I've found serenity My demons always seem to find me I'll just gas up my old truck And disappear in a cloud of dust And I'm so sick and tired of running I thought what I needed was the past in my rear view mirror Chose to ignore the writing. Now every time I look, I see it clear. Things are closer than they appear. Things are closer than they appear Closer than they appear. So before, you know, we kind of close out this last section, I kind of want to go through, uh, just to let the audience know, I was driving to work in Houston one day. And I get a text from Jared. It's like, hey, check out this song I worked on a few years ago with Randy and a couple other guys. I'm in my head. I'm like, oh, Randy Rogers. I didn't know they ever wrote together. You know, I open my phone and I'm listening to it and I hear Randy Travis's voice. And I'm like, wait, wait, yeah. the Randy, you know, like Randy yeah. Travis. And, uh, you know, I, I first saw Randy in concert when I was a freshman in college at UMHB. He actually came to campus and played in Belton. And we, yeah, I mean, for being a school that's not really known for the country life, it was, it was really cool to get to go see that. And, uh, then I saw him again a few years later at Billy Bob's. The first time I ever went to Billy Bob's, Randy Travis was the entertainer. I mean, that was a cool introduction to Billy Bob's. That's great. And I was, I was on my way from Temple to Amarillo. Well, at the end of that week, I went from Amarillo back through DFW and, uh, went and saw Crager that week so those were my first two concerts both within a week of each other oh, that's it, great it was an awesome time yeah and uh randy travis was telling the story he had just come out with i told you so or no, yeah. not not him but carrie underwood had just covered i told you so and he was talking about how he was talking to i 
it's been a while, so I'm probably going to butcher the details, but it was either one of his uh, siblings or offspring or somebody, somebody in his family, I believe. And they were like, Hey, do you like that song? I told you so. And they're like, yeah, we love Carrie Underwood. It's like, dang it. (laughs) 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 But kind of take me, take me through your, you know, early influences, how you got your start, what took you to Tennessee. And cause I believe, you know, Minnesota is a part of your story too. You've, you've been all over the place. So kind of, Nobody just wakes up one morning and starts writing with Randy Travis. Unless you're, well, Pe- unless you're Peggy it. Hill for anyone that's seen the right. King of the Hill episode. <laughs> that was a great one. <laughs> that was, a, that, that was almost as good as Ray Wiley being on squid billies. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> um, no man, I guess, yeah, I was, uh, you know, raised in St. Paul, Minnesota. Well, I, I was raised in Coon Rapids, Minnesota, which is just North of Minneapolis. Um, and, my dad, uh, my dad was the country music fan. Um, neither of my parents were musical. My mom, she, my mom had a pretty voice, but was not musical. Um, my dad got his love for country music from my grandmother, his mother. Um, they were, um, golly, and this is funny. Um, so my grandmother's mother and father, uh, his name was Oscar Johnson. And, uh, his wife's name was Laura Johnson. They were both Johnsons before they got married. Oh, cool. Um, and then my, my grandmother was Lorraine Johnson and my grandfather was Tony Johnson. They were both Johnsons before they got married. So they're <laughs> a, a giant Norwegian Swedish community up there. Uh, that's Northwest Wisconsin. My great grandparents, when they uh, immigrated here from Norway and Sweden, that's where they settled. Um, and, uh, but my, so my grandfather in the early forties, late thirties, early forties, he joined the army and he was, I believe he was stationed, uh, in like Fort Knox, I believe somewhere down there, um, somewhere in Kentucky. And that's where my grandmother, uh, she had liked music you know, before then, but then she, you know, of course, you know, WSM was, you know, you know, it's the air castle of the South. Yeah. I can still get WSM in Austin, Texas on a good night. Wow. Um, but, uh, but she, so she just, you know, fell in love with bluegrass and, and, you know, Hank Williams and Hank Snow and Webb Pierce and Leppy Frizzell and, you know, Bill Monroe and, and string bean and all these, you know, wonderful, you know, the fathers of, of country and bluegrass music. Um, I still have my grandmother's 78s, the 78 RPM records. Um, so, so she was the one who really, really enjoyed it. And my dad did. And so my dad was always listening to country music. Um, and, uh, so I just kind of naturally, you know, that's what my dad listened to. That's what I like. And when I was four or five years old, my older sister got to take guitar lessons. And it was from, it was my, my preschool teacher who was teaching the, her the guitar lessons. And I just, I wore my parents out until they let me take lessons too. And I guess they figured, well, he's, you know, five, four or five years old, he's not going to stick with it. And I did, I stuck with it. Um, I plateaued probably about seventh or eighth grade, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I enjoyed it. Um, and so I just kind of, I just kept playing, kept taking lessons. Um, my second guitar instructor was a guy named Dave Sanborn and he actually follows me on social media. Um, and we still talk, which is really cool. Um, and he was, he was an old metal guy. He had long hair and, and, uh, uh, he played in a rock band that was pretty successful up there. And, um, and then I guess around fourth or fifth grade, uh, my, my dad was, my dad was, he's one of the greatest coaches life coaches and basketball coaches you'll ever meet and we figured out or he figured out you know we both figured out that i'm pretty good at basketball so everything just kind of took a back seat i believe Um, that because i'm six two and you're taller than me (laughs) yeah but i I was a point guard um yeah my dad had me when i was 18 months old my mom used to joke all the time about this but I, i would sit in the kitchen you know and or in a basically this big old sagging diaper and I was dribbling a basketball in the kitchen. I would just sit there and do it for, I wouldn't say hours, but I would just sit there in the kitchen and dribble basketball. And, um, so yeah, so I started playing organized, you know, fourth or fifth grade. And, um, and, uh, that just kind of, like I said, that just kind of took over. I quit playing all other sports. I quit playing baseball, football, everything, hockey. 
I quit playing everything and just played basketball. And and starting after my fifth grade year, I started playing on all the AAU All Star teams, and was playing. Yeah, you know, during the summer, yeah, you know, I would be put on these Minnesota select teams, and I was playing against guys that eventually made it. You know, made it to the NBA. Um, in fact, the Lopez twins, Brooke, I think Brooke is playing for Brooke is playing for the Bucks and. I can't remember his brother's name, but I, so I was playing against seventh grade. Uh, yeah, it was seventh grade. It was the 13 and under the, the national championships were in Indianapolis, Indiana. The defending champs were, there was a team sponsored by Nike out of somewhere, somewhere in California, but it was, they were called as like Nike arc something. Um, but their, their big man was a guy named Alex Lopez and Alex was six eleven at 13 years old. Wow. And, and uh, we eventually we beat them. We beat them that year. We we made it to the uh, the final like the final eight, you know, in the nation, which was a big deal. But um, but anyway, uh, at at the opening ceremonies, there's these two kids running around in diapers that looked like they were five. <laughs> they b- because they were that tall. They were twins. And 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 uh, and and there, and uh, Alex's mother was a and like almost an Olympic swimmer. She was a, a an all American swimmer at Stanford. And anyway. Um, so I, I see these kids running around and those are now who the Lopez twins are playing in the NBA. <laughs> That's um, crazy. But, uh, but yes, I mean, basketball, uh, really took over. That was going to put me through college and everything, but I was still playing guitar. Uh, last day of school, sixth grade, Tracy DeBleek broke up with me <laughs> at a, at a party. Uh, and it was, and it was, God, it was at, I believe it was at my friend Tom Peterson's house and Tom Peterson had an older sister named Rachel uh, who was either in junior high or high school at the time. So, so there were older girls there. So when Tracy broke up with me and I was sobbing like a, just like a little girl, you know, I was so heartbroken. It was kind of cool because the older girls were giving me attention over that. (laughs) Um, but, uh, but I went home and I wrote a song about it. I still remember every single word to it and nobody will ever hear that song. I promise you. Oh, wow. Um, but uh, it was just that bad. You could tell a 12-year-old wrote it or a 13-year-old, <laughs> however old I was. But So I wrote my first song, and, um, and my parents liked it. You know, They thought that it was pretty cool. And then uh, 15, I wrote, I wrote Grandma's Rocking Chair, which I put on my last album. Oh, yeah. Um, but that was an act, we actually had a rocking chair that belonged to my grandparents. And you know, that, that song is somewhat uh, you know, biographical. It somewhat describes my grandparents and everything. And um so yeah that was a song i wrote about that rocking chair and, and you can tell i mean when you hear the song you can tell i was 15 when i wrote it but um it was my mom's favorite song of you know all the songs i ever wrote that was my mom's favorite and and uh yeah, i don't have my mom anymore so i just felt obliged to put that on there um but yeah so i wrote that song and i just kept on writing and, and my parents they were always very supportive of it they loved you know me writing songs and my dad you know he enjoyed listening to me practice and and um, so that that was really cool. You know, that was never it was. And my dad's the one who got me into songwriters. You know, he had, you know, the the first version of Sunday Morning Coming Down, I remember hearing is Christopherson's, not Cash's. Oh, cool. Um, you know, and he, he had Billy Joe Shaver records. And, and um, you know, he when you know, when I'd hear a, you know, a song that, you know, oh, well, you know, that's not really, uh, you know, you know, Mel Tillis wrote that song or, you know, <laughs> it's a, or it was an unmitigated gall by, uh, uh, fair and young. And I just love that title. Um, but who wrote it? Mel Tillis. Oh, and another fair and young song. Um, your time's coming. My dad's like, Nope. Farron didn't write that one. Chris Christopherson wrote that song. That was one of the first songs he ever wrote in Nashville. My dad, he just knew about songwriters. And, um, so I just, I loved it. Um, so yeah, so getting older, you know, moving on, um, you know, graduate high school. I'd already been playing in a band at that time. Um, I was underage. The guys that were in the band were of age and they were from a, uh, a, a progressive, what do you want to call it? A, it was a worship service at church. You know, they had their traditional service and then they had the one with the band. Um, what do they call that? Is it progressive the worship? Contemporary? Contemporary. Yeah. Thank you. Contemporary worship. Um, I think some places but, try to call it relevant or whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Who knows? But yeah, so the, they country music was getting hot again. You know, it was the early nineties and, and uh, it was getting pretty hot again. And, and they wanted to, yeah. You know, and these guys were all into rush and dream theater and stuff like that. Um, but they wanted to do a country band. So they 
said, hey, you want to be our singer? I'm like, yeah, let's do it. And uh, we called ourselves, and it was a joke, we called ourselves uh, Horse Doovers, but it was spelt like hors d'oeuvres. <laughs> and um, it was because the drummer, Tony Wick, uh, his parents went to a class reunion or something like that. And they, when they came home, you know, they brought the program home, and Tony was looking at it. And at the bottom of the program, it said live music hors d'oeuvres. And he thought Horse Doovers was the name of a or you know, hors d'oeuvres was the name of a band. <laughs> but he said, he said, who the heck is Horse Doovers? And anyway, so that's that became the name of our band. Did you say and, the drummer's uh, name was Tony Wick? Tony Wick, yeah. That's and crazy brother, because I went to high school with a drummer named Tony Wick. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, his, his brother, his older brother was Todd Wick, who was the keyboard player. Um, and then Tom Kutch has played bass. And then I was, I was playing lead mostly and lead singing and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so that, so I'd been playing in bars already and, and, you know, I'd have to go outside during the breaks. I wasn't allowed in there during the breaks and stuff like that. And, and it was a lot of fun though. We had a lot of fun and, um, I graduated. My parents were, uh, they were getting divorced. They, they had split up, uh, I guess that right before my senior year, I think, and it was just a goofy time. I was sick of basketball and I just told my parents after graduation, you know, I'm not going to go to college and play basketball. And I had scholarship offers. Um, I said, I want to, I want to do this music thing. And my parents were like, okay, we'll pick you. You're going to live with me. You got to get a job. And to make my mom happy, I tried college like six times. <laughs> and, 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 um, but, eat, but college kept on getting in the way of my gigs, you know, so I'd end up quitting. And, um, and I started taking it a little more serious and I thought, you know, I need to find a way to get into music. I need to meet people like influential people. And I thought, you know what? Radio, I'm going to try this radio thing. Uh, there was a school in Minneapolis called, uh, Brown. It was called Brown Institute at the time. I think now it's called Brown college, but they had a nine month certificate in broadcasting and like a 18 month degree in broadcasting. And I just went for the nine month. I, I went for this certificate. Well, six months into it, I ended up getting a job at a small market station in Amory, Wisconsin. It was uh, uh, WXCE 1260. We're more than just great country. Um, <laughs> and I got the, uh, so I got the job there as an announcer and I quit school and I started doing radio full time. And, I, you know, back then full time radio, it was like 10 grand a year at the most. And um, they sent me to the Hodag Country Music Festival in Rhinelander, Wisconsin. And I had to go there early and, get the campsite set up and I was doing backstage interviews. Um, I think that day I interviewed Terry Clark, um, who she told me I was cute and I thought that was so cool. That's a uh, milestone. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, the Bellamy brothers I interviewed them, Ty England. And, and I was really enjoying this and I was at the catering wagon and this guy who looked like a homeless guy, came up to me and we started talking and I told him I was in radio and we, we were just kind of, you know, yes, there's this huge trend right now that nineties country is, is coming back. You know what I mean? <laughs> and Ron and I were complaining about the stuff that was on the radio. This, yeah. this homeless guy. <laughs> so, so, so all this argument, and I just, I need to put this in here right now, this argument that country music is coming back. It's been going on. I, you can go as far back as Hank Williams. Yeah. When, when uh, my bucket's got a hole and it got censored from the radio because it mentioned beer. You know, there's, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's always been these divisions. The biggest, but the division really started. You go back to uh, the, you know, the fifties, sixties, seventies when Chet Atkins, yes, Chet Atkins, you know, the quintessential country music guitar player. And Billy Sherrill, who, in a roundabout way, gave me the idea for my album, they created what is known as the Nashville sound. The, um, you know, the big strings and all that stuff and yeah. this the huge orchestration. Well, that wasn't country music, by golly. And that created a, and yeah, these and they were producing George Jones and Ray Price, you know, and these huge, it's hard to, it's hard to imagine that somebody, you know, would hear, um, you know, he stopped loving her today and say, it's not country. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and people, people, people were saying that kind of stuff. So yeah, th this whole idea that country music is coming back, but everybody shut up. This argument <laughs> has been going on forever. Okay. And yes, I was complaining. I was that guy. I was that guy. I was complaining about nineties country when nineties country was 
you know, in the nineties, <laughs> yeah. I was complaining about it. So, so I don't remember if it was episode one or two, but I remember we kind of had this conversation a night or two ago about how, if you go back to listen to anything, like as you mentioned, like the fifties, if I go back to the sixties, whenever it was, when Willie Nelson's first two albums came out, mm-hmm. when his hair was short, he didn't have a beard. Mm-hmm. I think it was like the hello walls era, stuff like that. Anything yep. that was quote unquote country at that time and anything that was non-country, a lot of it sounded the exact same. Yeah. And I think the trend of non-country has always affected what goes into country. Like I'm guilty of, and when I say guilty, it's not guilt with remorse because I don't care. I was raised on country music, Christian music, but I grew up really loving country music and loving rock music. Those were the two things I loved. So I kind of overlay them. And a lot of people have been doing that for a long time, and I always say that yeah. it works, because I feel like if there's a Venn diagram of things you can mix, country, rock, and Christian can overlay. But yeah, I, I, never, I never grant an exception for this hip-hop, pop, snap track type stuff. And for me, I think that's what's really just kind of finally made people come to the conclusion. It's like, wow, they've really ruined country when, as you mentioned, the fade started years ago. And yeah. I think with the 90s, if you look at what was happening in rock music, uh, early nineties guns and roses was on top of the world. But then when they broke up and Motley Crue was getting back on drugs, Aerosmith getting back on drugs and they all faded for a bit. Yeah. That kind of opened the door for the grunge era. And I think people being experimental with guitar sound kind of bled into Nashville for a little bit. Now it was a different kind of experimental guitar, but yeah. there was a lot more like Dwight Yoakam electric guitar going on. And I don't know, like, the 90s sound, part of why I like it is you still had steel guitar. You still had fiddle. There was still melody. There were still stories being told, even if the sound was different. And yeah. it was far different than this like tailgate, fireball shots, bro country, short skirt stuff going on now. Yeah. And even, you know, there's a YouTube video out there saying that and it's called This Beat is Killing Country Music. And they talk about how we're not even in bro country anymore. We're in this yeah. snap track that every single artist is using, even Zach Brown and guys like that, that people want to give yeah. exemptions to. They're all doing it. Yeah. I'm just like, man, <laughs> stop doing it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it does get a little crazy. Um, and it, yeah, that stuff does get a little old to me. It just doesn't, that type of music has never resonated with me. Right. Now it resonates to a lot of people and the trend. It, it let's face it that, you know, the, in the in the nineties, okay, um, like when yeah, you know, Shania Twain was hitting. Um, you know, Shania married Muttley. You know, Shania's first record was awful. It was terrible. I mean, she was cute. I, re- I remember seeing the <laughs> video for for the first. Uh, what made you say that was the first video I ever saw. She got gorgeous, but the record was terrible. She marries Mutt Lang, who is Def Leppard's producer. Yeah. And and Mutt starts writing, you know, co-writing all her songs and producing all her songs. Boom, look what's ha- you know. Shania was putting out country Def Leppard albums. Yeah. Um, Dwight Yoakam, however, you know, the guitar sound, you know, Buck Owens started that back in the 60s. Mm-hmm. Dwight Yoakam was copying Buck Owens. So what Dwight was doing was nothing new. The, the guitar experimentation really started with Buck Owens. Yeah. Um, and then of course Chet Atkins and you know the great guitar players back then. And you can go as far as you know experimental music goes um you know hank williams and a lot of songwriters know this but just like the general public does not know hank williams wrote move it on over you know the the big george thoroughgood hit hank yeah. williams wrote that um and if you listen to the backbeat structure of that song it was rock and roll before rock and roll was even invented mm-hmm. um but that song uh was not very well accepted by the country music community because it's you know it sounded like a different kind of music. It sounded like, you know, the music that, you know, the blues players were, were playing. Um, you know, it sounded, and Hank learned how to play guitar from a, a you know, he was a, a peanut salesman and shoeshine guy. I believe it was downtown Montgomery or whatever. His name was T tot. And he's the one who taught Hank how to play guitar. So Hank, you know, Hank learned, you know, the rhythms of, uh, you know, of what, you know, the black guitar players and, you know, the black singers and songwriters were doing of that time. Um, so when he brought that into his music, that at times created a division. There are some people that that say the song Love Sick Blues was actually written by T Todd. Um uh they've settled the publishing now on that one. Um, but yeah, I mean so 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 those little divisions from different kinds of music that bleed into country, 
have always created a division. It's ridiculous to look back at Hank Williams and say, move it on over is not country. It's ridiculous to say that, but at the time it wasn't, you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> so, 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 so for me, looking back to the nineties saying third rock from the sun was not country, you know, you know, rest in peace, Joe Diffie. Oh, but yeah. you, know, you know, back then, you know, when, when that, when that, the dance mix or whatever, you know, when the, the, the voice would, you know, welcome to earth, third rock from the sun, you know what I'm talking about? That really weird voice. Yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> That, no experimental. That, was a, that was just a huge turnoff for a lot of traditionalists. But these days, it's not so bad. Yeah. You know, now, now it's the snap tracks. And yeah, so, so it definitely goes in its little waves. Um, you know, there's always going to be some other kind of music that, that bleeds into country music. And, and the people that always bought records, when I got my first publishing deal, there were 2,000, probably 2,000 staff writers in Nashville. Um, now there's, I think there's less than 200, but the, back then the people that bought records, um, and that's one thing Garth Brooks did Garth Brooks and Shania Twain, they changed what country music is marketed to. Yeah. Country music used to be marketed to, and you know, what, you know, what could be Dwight Yoakam, Randy Travis, any of those people, it was, you know, older 30, you know, 20 something, 30 somethings. Um, if you sold 500,000 records. That was huge. If you got a gold record, that was a smash hit in country music. And after Garth and Shania, if if you don't sell a million, boom, record deal's gone. But they changed, and it was it was a it was great for the record labels and the songwriters. It was gr- honestly it was a great time for songwriters. Um, if you could just sneak in a cut on you know on on a record that sold five hundred thousand or a million copies, I mean you're looking at a you know, a fifty to a hundred thousand dollar paycheck on a song that wasn't even a single. But that, but what they did is they changed the marketing to okay, it was basically like fourteen to twenty two year old girls because they were the ones buying the records. So it really changed the marketing to who was going to buy the most records, and it was that teenage female component that was buying the records, that demographic. So that okay, boom, country music explodes. You're selling all kinds of records. If you don't sell a million records, okay, boom, you're gone. And now, who really drives what country music is marketed to? It's Ironically, still- they're marketing country, and I put quotes, country music to city kids. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and so, that's I mean, what's ruined it. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's, Ladies and gentlemen, this is why we have the Electoral College. <laughs> exactly, yeah, exactly. But no, I mean, it's, it's just different. It, it's, you know, every, every generation, I, didn't, I shouldn't even say every generation, let's just say every decade is going to have... Um, you know, stuff like this where, you know, where the marketing demographic is completely changed or the way music is presented, you know, via streaming or, you know, it used to be, you know, cassettes and vinyl and then it became CDs. And, you know, it's funny, a CD is the best possible sound you can get. That is the, you know, digitally, I'm a big fan of, you know, vinyl, but, you know, CDs on paper, that is the best possible sound you can get. How is everybody getting their music these days? A click it of a button not, for free. Exactly. And and it's and it's MP3s. Yeah. I mean, it's not even the best possible sound you can get. So I mean, all, all that all that stuff is changing. And um, you know, it's it's not something that yeah, you know, yeah, I can sit and like I said, I can sit and complain about it all day and complain about what's wrong, or I can try to work with this. I I don't want to write so obviously I don't want to write songs with snap tracks. That's just not my thing. Right. Um, you know, the guys that do it, they do it very well. You know, let them keep doing it. Okay, I just need to write better songs. Yeah, you know, I got I got to write better songs. I don't have to write about what they're writing about, but what I'm writing about, I've just got to do a better job at. It. And I've got you know I've got to do okay. I've got to find a little bit better production. I've got to you know what I mean. You you got to step up your game. Yeah. Um, if you want to stay competitive and and uh, I've I've completely sidetracked from what we were talking about, but. Um, but, uh, I think at this point but, in your story, it was you, you'd been writing in Nashville. And so, Oh yeah. Oh, take us over, you, you wrote in Nashville and somehow you ended up back in Texas. So how did that look? Um, well, let's see when, when streaming hit, when the whole Napster thing hit, um, <laughs> that really smacked songwriters and the, and, you know, it really smacked us hard. Yeah. Uh, cause the people, and, and what was it? LimeWire and all that. LimeWire, so people, Napster. People quit buying music. And they nobody was prepared people. for it. It came out of nowhere. And, yeah, nobody was. Nobody was. I mean, Spotify and, there were people, and iTunes, all that. That's just prepared LimeWire without the computer STDs. It's, exactly. <laughs> and no, exactly. No, that, that that's that's a wonderful way of putting it. But yeah, we weren't ready for it, and I kind of had to learn how to do something else. And and my first publisher, 
um, who is, you know, how I met Randy Travis and all that. He was Randy Travis's bus driver for years. Um, he was always in the bus business. So, um, there was a new bus company open, opening up, uh, a guy named John Christie was opening up this company and, uh, John was Daryl Dodd's old tour manager, sons of the desert, you know, a few other people. And, um, anyway, so I went down there, I got hired as an electrician and within six months, it was a brand new company. Within six months, I was running the whole shop. Um, I was designing and, and, uh, you know, running you're telling all the carpenters what to do and electricians and everything else and uh, ended up i ended up building a couple of buses for buck cherry uh, <laughs> built a couple built a couple of buses for gibson guitars uh mercy me um we leased we leased to nickelback we leased <laughs> to uh uh brad paisley had a couple of buses on you know the george Strait winter tour the christmas tour um so anyway i was building buses and i was making a lot a lot more money than i ever made um, and I was able to buy my catalog back, uh, my publishing catalog. Oh, cool. Um, so I was, and that's when I started my own publishing company, which I'm not, a lot of people say that I, you know, I, I have a publishing company. It's really easy to do. And it's not, yeah. if if you're not getting a lot of airplay and stuff like that, a publishing company, it's, it's just a way of saying, okay, all the, the writer's rights and the publishing rights are all mine not just the writer's rights. I also have the publishing rights. So that's, that's, yeah, that's really all that means. I'm not saying like I have, I've got writers signed under me or anything like that. It just means that I have, uh, I went through all the BMI paperwork. I've got my own publishing company, quote unquote. Um, but yeah, so I was making, uh, and so I was able to do that. And eventually, um, Daryl Dodd, I hadn't met him yet. Um, he was playing for John Michael Montgomery's birthday party up in Henderson, Kentucky. And him and Shane Decker flew in and wanted to, wanted to, they asked John if they could go up there on a bus. And John's like, yeah, let's go. And John said, come on, Jared, let's go. And so that's how I met Daryl. It was in a bus with Shane Decker and John Christie driving up to Henderson, Kentucky. And we just kind of hit it off. And he played for John Michael's birthday party. And uh, John showed up in sweats and like a blaze orange (laughs) hoodie and, and mustard stains all over it got up on the stage a little bit, a little bit happy. It was his birthday, you know, and he, he did a, like a, a 30 minute sweet home, Alabama. Uh, oh gosh. And, uh, he was having fun, man. He was just, he, you know how we get when, you know, when we're celebrating and, you know, we just want to keep going. Yeah. Um, but, but that was the, that weekend. And then, uh, Daryl, uh, he was coming back to town a lot. Um, talking to Brett Beavers, who was Dirk Bentley's producer. Brett used to play bass for, um, uh, Daryl and another guy that worked for Daryl Blake Chansey uh, ended up ended up going on to produce the Dixie Chicks. Um, so so yeah, Daryl's people in Daryl's organization did very well for themselves um, after Daryl left Nashville. But he was coming back and um, he would stay with us in White's Creek um, you know, because we had a couple extra rooms and he would stay with us. And Daryl and I just hit it off. And uh, one day I was going to the studio. Um, I was demoing empty pillow that western swing song i wanted to pitch it to the time jumpers um one of the carpenters at the bus company i worked at was the drummer for the time jumpers at the time and i just love the time jumpers i mean they are if y'all want to hear a super group it's the time jumpers it, back then uh, vince gill was their backup guitar player that is how good these guys are um vince gill is now their guitar player um and what John, band has he not been in? <laughs> exactly. Um, and John Huey was the steel guitar player at the time. John Huey's gone now, but John is the steel guitar player that all those legend, legendary Conway Twitty intros, all that stuff, that, that's John Huey playing steel guitar. Just a wonderful group. Um, anyway, uh, so I was demoing the song to pitch to them, and Daryl had nothing going on, and he came to the studio with me, and we cut, you know, we cut the song. Um, that is Jimmy Wallace. That is Gavin DeGraw's uh, piano keyboard player playing that Western swing piano in that song. Um, just he's so awesome. And uh, Glenn Duncan playing fiddle, and Daryl ended up singing background vocals on it. And then a little bit later, I think I'm trying to remember. I think I'd come to Texas once. I, th- I think, golly, I was drinking so much back then. <laughs> I, I believe I had come to Texas once and and did a little radio tour and it went well. 
okay, yeah, it was okay. It was at the end of my first little radio tour. I get to um, the station in uh, Golly Pleasant. Is it Pleasant View? It's out in East Texas. Um, I believe it was uh, Katie Hines or something like that. Used to be the music director out there. And um, I had seen her on my way in and on my way back. I was doing my interview there and she said, Oh, Daryl's promoter called. He wants you to call him. I'm like, Oh crap. I'm in trouble. <laughs> and and so I called Daryl real quick. He's like, Oh no, man, it's okay. He, he loves the song because it was getting reported and his promoter saw that. And then anyway, it was uh, Dave Smith who runs, you know, Smith music. He basically runs the Texas charts. Um, and uh, I called Dave and he was uh, like, man, I love the song. I, I thought he was going to ask me to pull it. And, uh, he wanted, you know, of course he wanted me to hire him as a promoter. And I'm like, dude, I'm broke. You know, I'm, I've, I've got a hundred bucks left to get me back to Tennessee from you know here. Uh, you know, plus I've, I've got to buy booze along the way. You know, that, that was a big priority back then. Um, and, uh, but he told me how to basically, you know, how to self promote. Um, and, uh, and so I started doing that. And then of course, uh, my Twitter account gets hacked. I met my wife and, um, you know, Daryl has been a huge help, uh, since I've, you know, since I've been here and, um, I'll, I'll never leave. I'll never leave what, what, what Texas music fans have done for me and Texas in general has done for me. Um, I would feel, um, yeah, I'd, I'd feel like I was cheating on like my wife if I lived anywhere else, but Texas and played music <laughs> anywhere else, but Texas, you know, it's, I can't go. Um, you know, between what Daryl's done and Ray Wiley Hubbard, um, you know, I've been given just that I'm able to play my music. I I play my songs. I'm not the greatest singer in the world, but people showed up, you know, they show up to hear me sing them and every once in a while they screw up and they play my songs on the radio. You know, it's, it's, this is just a wonderful, you know, place for me to be. And, and, uh, yeah, I mean, there's no better place on earth than the Republic of Texas. No, there ain't, there ain't, man. I mean, it's, it's, it's it's just wonderful that, you know, the music here and just, just, I don't know. I love the people. It's, it's just the most wonderful place there is, you know, I, the old saying, you know, it's the greatest country on earth. It really is. But yeah, I, I could never, I could never, you know, base myself out of anywhere else for my music career than Texas. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be Austin. You know, it could be anywhere in Texas. Um, there's people, just no other place I want to be. People look at me funny because I say North Carolina is the best state in the country. And they're like, how in the world can you say that? I'm like, because Texas is a republic. That doesn't count. <laughs> exactly. 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 And I spent part of my childhood in Carolina. So it's like my silver medal. But it's interesting, yeah. you know, when we were looking to get out of Houston, I was so fed up with living in a big city. And that's nothing against Houstonians or anything because it's still in Texas. And there were a lot of great people there. But I don't yeah. do big traffic. I don't do big crime. And I need yeah. nature, you know, those yeah. things. And I need a good country music scene and it just wasn't happening. So we were looking all over the place mm-hmm. and we wanted a good little small town with a good community and stuff wasn't opening in my field because uh, lo and behold, listeners, I'm not just a musician. I'm not that good yet. And <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I looked all over and stuff was opening up in North Carolina, Tennessee and Alabama. <laughs> and I was looking yeah. at all three of those places. Wow. And uh, unbeknownst to most people, I have somewhat of a third album. Yeah, I've got three albums out there, but one of them's kind of a mix and touch up of the first two. Um, yeah. I have a third one basically written. I don't have all the lyrics on everything, but it's a Southern rock album. It's not even like it's heavier than anything I've put out. And it's yeah. really just because when my mentality was you're going to live out in the Southeast soon, you need to have music that can sell out there. Yeah. And the more I kind of looked into some of the childhood memories I had from North Carolina and what I was probably going to be facing soon, possibly going back out there, it actually put me in the mood to write some Southern music. I'm like, well, all right then I've got a a song called living in Dixie. I've got one called Tennessee Brown. I mean, there's, there's songs that would fit out there. And then, you know, praise God, we were able to stay in Texas. We're back in a town. We loved living in the first time and we're loving it even more now. Um, But now I've got all these songs sitting on my computer that I'm like, you know, I could still release them, <laughs> but no, you still can. Yeah. A prime example, American aquarium. Where are they from? Right. Raleigh, North Carolina. They're from Raleigh, I think, North Carolina. I think, uh, I think Wendell, North Carolina to be precise. Yeah. And they're very much a Southern rock band. Oh yeah. 
um you know they're, they're americana they're whatever but they're very much a southern rock band and yeah so yeah that kind of music can definitely fly here somebody tweeted um, last year they go who's the best non-texas country band and somebody put american aquarium who's the best texas country band american aquarium <laughs> right no they're good bj's another one who uh um yeah he's been through the whole uh addiction cycle yeah he's been sober for quite a while now and uh another inspirational guy to um you know, musically especially um, yeah just another you know real real inspirational guy bj on the off chance you hear this you're welcome to come on here and talk uh smithfield barbecue from raleigh you can talk bojangles we'll talk up carolina texas stuff nice. anytime Man, you want to come had, on <laughs> i haven't had bojangles in forever i've been, been i told steven oh crap oh, yeah. i told steven james i said we need to play a show together in tuscaloosa alabama he's like what i said that is the crossover point where there is a Whataburger and a Bojangles in the same town. Yep. And it's about halfway from where he's at to where we're at. And the last time I went up through the southeast, I stopped in Knoxville, Tennessee. And I had in a cooler in the back of my truck all the sauces from Whataburger from H-E-B. Nice. I ordered yeah. a Bojangles biscuit, two, two of them. I ate one normal and I took the second one and I put honey butter on a Bojangles chicken biscuit. And yeah. it was like the what a jingle chicken biscuit. And it was one of the best things I've ever eaten. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. God, is, is it Tuscaloosa or is it, golly, it might be Montgomery or Birmingham. Maybe it's Birmingham. They have the, um, they have a barbecue joint there and the name will come to me, I hope, but they do, um, when they barbecue their chicken, they, they make a white barbecue sauce Huh. and it's, it's mayo based, believe it or not. Oh, wow. And, and it's it's very much it's, I believe it's Birmingham. If anyone's listening to this, I know you, you'll know what I'm talking about. I've eaten there. I can't believe I can't remember the name because every time I go through there, I stop there. Uh, but yeah, they dip their chicken in this white barbecue sauce, and it's you know it's just it's a uh, is it a half chicken or leg? I think it's a half chicken, and they'll and they'll dip it in this barbecue sauce, and it's white and. You know, as a, of course, you know, Texas, we're all about the dry rubs. And, and to me, you know, Texas barbecue is my favorite, but I don't care where you go. There's good barbecue. It can be Carolina style with the vinegar and mustard. It can be Memphis style with the, you know, with the sweet sauces. Um, the best pork ribs I've ever had, the best pork ribs I've ever had, Rendezvous Bistro in Memphis, Tennessee. They are dry rubbed. There's no sauce on them. Um, and they're charcoal smoked. They're not wood smoked. Uh. They're charcoal smoked in an old coal chute. I mean, it is, it's, it's, every, and the, and the dry rub, um, cause the guy that bought the place back in the early 1900s, uh, he was Greek. Um, the dry rub is very, it's full of Greek seasoning. So it, like, it goes against everything that Memphis barbecue should be. <laughs> and they are the best, they're the best pork ribs I've had anywhere. They're amazing. Um, now I'm extremely yeah, hungry. I, <laughs> Go, going back to that look that up when you're done garrett yeah um but that that place and i believe it's birmingham that does white barbecue sauce on their chicken it's it's phenomenal it is and i don't know if it's the best i've ever had but it's like one of the most one of the most memorable just because the white sauce you know throws you off but it's so good <laughs> it awesome. is so good well, I've got three questions I'd like to close everyone out with towards the end of these right. interviews. First one is, if you could collaborate with anyone out there to write a song, who would it be? Right now, living or, well, I'm going to say living. We're not going to go dead because that <laughs> list just gets too long. It, yeah, it's um, too tough to do. Of course, Ray Wiley Hubbard or Billy Joe Shaver. Um, and I was supposed to write, when, when Ray got back from all this Nashville stuff, we were going to get together and write. And then, of course, the COVID thing hit, and um, yeah, we're and Ray, of course, he's he's in that high risk category. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so we're staying away from each other. So hopefully, hopefully, within the next uh, year, I can fulfill the uh, Ray Wiley Hubbard co-write, and then uh, then I can work on Billy Joe Shaver. <laughs> That's awesome. Y'all could write one called a uh, Wacko from the Snake Farm. <laughs> There we go. Uh, second one. If you could headline any venue, what would it be? Ooh, wow. Yeah. Okay, let's do uh, the Ryman. Oh, cool. Yeah. The Ryman. The Ryman. Um, and the Ryman has had shows where it's just a guy and his guitar. I believe Christofferson did it because he's Christofferson and he can. Uh, but yeah, I would. The Ryman and. Um, if I want to go Texas, 
golly, there's so many places here. <laughs> um, I'm going to, I'm going to go from a songwriter standpoint. This, that's a great, there's, there's way too many in Texas, dude. I know. I mean, it, <laughs> if, if you, if you want to go the dance hall route, I mean, yeah, you got, yeah, broken spoke, you got green, you got just so freaking many of them. Uh, you got the, the cotton club out here in Granger. That's kind oh, of a yeah. great place. I mean, no, the Austin city limits is always up there. Yeah. Um, you know, that's every song, you know, every Texas songwriter's dream. I mean, that's, you know, that's the, the Willie Nelson trying basically. And every songwriter who's ever been anybody in Texas music has played Austin city limits, you know, Guy Clark, um, you know, Robert Earl Keen. Uh, I don't believe Ray Wiley Hubbard's ever played it, but yeah, I mean, just that, that's just kind of a, a shrine to Texas songwriters. And I know there's a bunch of them out there that I just can't think of right now. I don't know, man. <laughs> Sorry. I, 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 cussed, I finally but, get to use the bleeper. Yeah, I've been waiting a while. Um, <laughs> I would have to say the Ryman would be, um, you know, just kind of the, the pinnacle, not, not the new Opry building, um, there at Opry land, but the Ryman, you know, the mother yeah, church, the real know, one. That, <laughs> that would be, that is just such a universally respected place. You know, it, it's, it's very much respected in Texas. It's very much respected in rock music. It's very much respected in gospel. You know, it's, just, it's just a very respectable shrine to music in general. Final question. And yeah. um, that is, what is the funniest or craziest story you could tell from your music career so far? And I, I have to reiterate, I'm not saying what's the craziest one. I'm saying what's the craziest one you can tell. <laughs> yeah, yeah was, there's and, a whole lot that, that cannot be uh, uh, repeated <laughs> on this show. Because yeah. you're, and that's one thing I respect about you is that you're um, you're always, uh, I, I want to say like fa- maybe not even family oriented, but you're always just, just trying to keep it. Um, you know, keep it in the middle of the road. It's very, what, what you do is very respectable where I do some other podcasts where some people might listen to it and say, Oh my goodness, that's awful. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I appreciate it. My, mo- my mother will probably be listening. So I got to behave. Exactly. Um, no. Okay. So I thought about this and I was working, uh, with Andy Griggs and I had leased him, uh, a bus and this was before gps was on your phone and it really it, it was just as gps's were coming out that you, you could like mount to your dashboard and um we were trying this new driver out and he downloaded or he, he printed out the maps off MapQuest or whatever it was back then um to get to this place it was uh in west virginia somewhere um and so he prints he prints out the maps from MapQuest, and instead of it, it, it they just took you the shortest way. You know, they didn't take you necessarily the best way back then. Right. It was just the shortest way. And so instead of like cutting up through Bluefield, I believe it was Kentucky and stuff like that, it brought us, you know, it, the roads just started getting more narrow and more narrow. And like, we were supposed to be there at like, you know, well, according to whatever the map said, we, we should have been there at like two in the morning. And we weren't because these roads just kept on getting narrower and narrower and these little hairpin turns and all of us in very shortly after that, the sun's coming up and this blacktop goes away and it's a, it's a dirt mining trail is what it is. <laughs> and so we're, we're driving this 45 foot, you know, half a million dollar bus down this mining trail and it's, it's an old coal mining trail. And, um, and you know, the, the turns are getting scary and, and he just keeps going and, and we come around this one turn and, uh, the road just collapses oh. and the, it literally the road collapsed. And so the back, uh, right while well, the back, uh, passenger side tag axle and dual are hanging off the side of it. It was like a 100 foot drop. It was a cliff on a mountain. Um, and so the bus is hanging there and everybody's in a hurry to get out. You know, we're all panicking cause we don't want to roll off this, this mountainside. And Griggs comes out. Griggs didn't come out. He was asleep back there. And, um, yeah, I made a call to John Christie and then I uh, made a call. And I was barely getting cell phone reception up there. Um, and I finally, you know, I found a wrecker and this wrecker came up. Uh, the name of the road was state line road. One side of the road was Virginia. The other side was West Virginia. And so this constable comes from, uh, I believe it was from in front of us, which was the West Virginia side. Um, and so did the, the wrecker, the record, the constable came up with the wrecker 
and the wrecker looked at it and he couldn't get around the bus and he's like well he says i gotta drive around the mountain uh, i gotta come up behind it and i'm like okay well, an hour and a half later, he finally comes up behind us because it took him that long to drive around the mountain and get up <laughs> behind us. But anyway, as the constable, then the constable was an old fella, probably in his seventies or eighties. Um, really nice old gentleman. And anyway, Griggs, they had been, I believe I was sober at that time. Uh, I had a little stint of sobriety back then, uh, but they'd been partying the night before and, and Griggs wobbles off the bus finally as it's hanging off the side of this cliff. And he just walks out and he just, he urinates, you know, he just <laughs> does it right. You know, it, it's all guys, you know what I mean? Yeah. There's no women around. So he just urinates and the constable was from West Virginia <laughs> and he goes, and he just leans over to Griggs and goes, son, could, would you mind doing that on the other side of the road? That's Virginia. <laughs> <over there." laughs> and Griggs did that. And anyway, they, uh, the record came up. It literally, it lifted the back of the bus up and put it back on the road. And, and we finally got to where, and this, and this was a different world over in that part of the country. I mean, it's, and the gig was in some holler, uh, couldn't even, I couldn't even take you there. It was so far back. Uh, but it, about, you know, five, 6,000 people showed up. It was, it was like their one festival they had one festival day, you know, every, every year that they had. And, and, uh, it it turned out to be a lot of fun, but yeah, that, bus hanging off the side of that cliff and then and then the constable's telling us yeah we uh they lose about you know three four trucks a year off this cliff i'm like what (laughs) and yeah apparently that that corner was a huge problem and uh but back then you know it was map quest you know we didn't have you know gps on our phone and i don't even know if we well it might have been the beginning of being able to like post pictures to maybe myspace from your phone that's how long ago (laughs) Uh, but yeah, that was, that was one of the funniest things that ever happened that I can say on the radio that that constable asking Griggs to go to the bathroom on the other side of the road, because that was Virginia. Um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> well, Jared, I, I appreciate you coming on this program and, uh, obviously a young program, but I'm glad you did it. And, uh, that was a lot of fun. And uh, what song should I close it out with? Either empty pillow or love around here. I am from Amarillo, so it's going to be empty pillow. <laughs> never knew love at first sight Till lost in Texas one Saturday night I heard how it takes place I knew it when I saw her face I knew that I had met my match And though I had an airplane to catch Watching that old clock is a waste of time The only hand that matters will soon be in mine There's an empty pillow in Amarillo That I am wanting to fill I was never more honest When I promised I'd come back And I will With tears in her eyes as she waved goodbye I can see her standing there still There's an empty pillow in Amarillo That I am wanting to fill Right now it's all that I can do To stay away and see this job through We all need to settle down I'll be there in that Texas town There's an empty pillow in Amarillo That I am wanting to fill I was never more honest When I promised I'd come back And I will With tears in her eyes as she waved goodbye I can see her standing there still There's an empty pillow in Amarillo that I am wanting to fill. How about that fiddle now? There's an empty pillow in Amarillo 
that I am wanting to fill I was never more honest when I promised I'd come back And I will With tears in her eyes as she waved goodbye I can see her standing there still There's an empty pillow in Amarillo That I am wanting to fill Yeah, there's an empty pillow in Amarillo That I am wanting to fill